Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started very soon. If I can just ask everyone to take their seat. Welcome all to the 20th meeting of the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee. I would also note that this is our last meeting of this particular term. Um, and I hope that everyone can stay for lunch. Uh, we've made some, uh, uh, we've ordered some food and just to celebrate the end of our term and also to formally say thank you to our hardworking uh, committee members who've given their time so freely. Um, I think before we conclude the meeting as, uh, as it relates to this particular term, I'm also going to give people an opportunity and a chance to speak. I know Rahima has asked uh, for that moment. Um, so are there any uh, declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? Okay. Uh, seeing none, thank you. Uh, can I please have the, someone to move the confirmation of the minutes? Okay. Thank you very much, Monica. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Thank you. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting today on the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nations, the Haudenosaunee and the Huron-Wendat, and Toronto remains home to many diverse Indigenous peoples. And tomorrow is National Aboriginal Day. Uh, for those who are interested, you, are, you can join us at 5.30 a.m. I said that correctly, 5.30 a.m on the square, uh, Nathan Phillips Square, tomorrow for the, uh, the flag raising. Thank you. Um, if we can uh, begin our meeting now with uh, a round of introductions, uh, this would be very helpful. Uh, so it's Kristen Wong Tam, City Councilor, and if I can just uh, ask everyone to move around the chamber here and to state your name clearly into the microphone, then those who are following the proceedings uh, can also uh, know who's in the room. Janice Dix with the City Clerk's Office. I'm Carol Kostinen with the City Clerk's Office. Janet Davis, City Councilor. Wendy Porch, Committee Member. Yin Brown, City, Me uh, City. Committee Member. <laughs> Monica Winkler, Committee Member. Michael Michelli, Committee Member. Mike Layton, City Councilor, Committee Member. Glenn Hart, committee member. Rahim Amullah, vice chair. Deirdre Boyle, accessibility consultant. Okay, as it has become tradition in our space, we introduce everyone with a microphone around the, uh, around the chamber. Uh, go ahead, Lorraine. Lorraine Hewitt, Robin, Robin Cook with the city clerk's office and public appointments. Sean McIntyre with the city of Toronto poverty reduction office. Hi, Lan Nguyen, Deputy Chief Information Officer. Michael Negro, City of Toronto Staff. Melissa Jen, City of Toronto Staff. Marianne Bedard, Director with Shelter Support and Housing Administration. Uh, Emily Gauze with Shelter Support and Housing Administration. Narina Nagra with the Equity, Diversity and Human Rights Division. I'm Alex Hillman with the Equity, Diversity and Human Rights Division. Emily Daigle, Accessibility Advocate. Thank you, Ashley. Okay, thank you, Peter. And then we're just gonna go to this side of the room. Lynn Genova, Clerk Secretariat, and I don't think. Lorene Bodium, Parks, Forestry and Recreation. Okay, wonderful, thank you very much. So we're gonna go through the, uh, the order paper and just uh, review the matters. Uh, DI 20.1 is the chair's report, which we'll hold. Uh, we'll deliver that shortly. Uh, DI 20.2 um, is are the uh, working committee working group updates, and we're going to hold that because we'll receive those updates very shortly. DI 20.3 we're going to hold for staff presentation, and this is regarding the City of Toronto's public appointments process. DI 20.4 wheel trans appeal process we're holding that for staff presentation, um, and the same goes for DI 20.5 Toronto Poverty Reduction Strategy update on the 2018 Community Engagement Initiatives, as well as DI 20.6 accessibility features of the City of Toronto website. Um, and that will bring us to the formal end of our meeting. Uh, I don't believe there's any additions of new business and the clerks are shaking their head with a little bit of relief on their face. Uh, <laughs> so I'll begin with the, uh, the chair's report. I'll, I'll, 
Um, I will try to keep it short, and I have to admit, um, I've got four pages of notes and I will not read it all, um, but I did want to let you know that uh, the National Accessibility Awareness Week, uh, as many of you know, as all of you know really, it was May the 27th to June the 2nd, um, and I want to acknowledge that that has recently passed and hope that everyone was able to celebrate and participate in, uh, in the meaningful events that took place. The National Deaf Blind Awareness Month, uh, we had the first flag raising ever here uh, at City Hall, and I was honored to participate in the event and to bring remarks on behalf of our committee. Uh, the flag raising was organized in partnership with the National Deafblind Awareness Month Working Group. And this working group includes individuals in partnership to plan and execute a national awareness um, campaign each June that celebrates the achievements and contributions of individuals who are deafblind uh, from coast to coast. Um, in 2015, the Canadian Senate passed a motion to recognize June as Deafblind Awareness Month across Canada. And according to recent demographic uh, studies, uh, there are approximately 65,000 Canadians, um, and we anticipate that that number is actually underreported, uh, who are um, uh, captured in this, uh, this population. And, uh, and we know that there's still a lot of work to be done to recognize the contributions and to remove barriers for people who are um, deaf blind. Uh, accessible parking permits update. This is an issue that doesn't seem to ever go away. I have been tracking this and managing, I guess, as best as I can uh, as your chair for the, the four years that I've served on this term. Very recently, I had a meeting with uh, Minister McCharles, uh, who is no longer our minister. Um, after the, she actually was, um, uh, she did not stand for re-election, uh, but she was very effective in her position as in the. Uh, uh, as the Minister of Government and Consumer Relations, she and I sat down at Queen's Park. Uh, we met on April the 30th. We talked about the Provincial Accessibility Parking Permit Program. Uh, we had, um, the, I had been staffed and she had been staffed with the, uh, the bureaucrats that are in charge of reforming that program. Uh, and she are, she was able to inform me that there's no planned changes to the eligibility requirements of the program. If you recall, there was some talk about perhaps needing a second doctor's note, um, which would have created some additional barriers. Um, the minister did advise um, me that her, uh, her staff, through the Accessibility Directorate of Ontario, had consulted a number of key stakeholders to address the issue of misuse and the abuse of the accessible parking permits. Um, and they are looking to make further enhancements to this program, uh, and these enhancements are not limited to the following. Uh, time limit for a return of interim and expired permits, uh, notification to permit holders to return interim and expired permits, development of a system to track return permits, process to request return of permits from the estate of a deceased person or tracking of such returns, the prominent display of expiry dates on permits, um, improved communication with the municipal uh, law enforcement officers uh, across Ontario, because everything they do affects all across the province. And they wanted to further develop recommendations to address modernizing uh, this accessibility parking uh, permit program. Uh, the minister was also informed um, that, uh, that any reporting of fraudulent permit uh, should be uh, directed to the Toronto police uh, as investigation and enforcement fall under that jurisdiction. Um, I think that we are going to um, continue to track the issue. It doesn't have a quick resolution. Uh, one thing that was made evidently clear to me at, that this, at this meeting with the provincial representatives was that um, there was an understanding that the City of Toronto was extremely um, generous uh, with the time allotments uh, that are f for free parking for people who had those permits. So when someone has access to the permit that shouldn't have access to the permit, then they get certain benefits that they also should not have access to. So it's this vicious cycle that we haven't been able to close, um, but we are still continuing to track it. Um, so I want to give you that update. For those who are interested in the sidewalks for all update, um, there is a, a summer work plan. I know that this committee had followed that work intensely. We had hoped that it would have passed that joint committee, um, but nevertheless it did not. And uh, there is a significant amount of work that's now underway in, uh, that, took, uh, that, was, uh, that led us to that report. 
<laughs> Councillor Davis, I see the editorializing on your face. I totally agree with you. Um, and uh, there is going to be some follow-up work. So the staff were also asked to review a requirement that any clear way shift to be cane detectable and are currently reviewing the potential study of scenarios where tactile guidance may be appropriate, uh, where a separated bike and pedestrian facility becomes a multi-use trail, as well as ensuring new development on a street block basis follows best practices for direct, contiguous, and straight pedestrian clearways. And as a part of this study, consultation with this committee uh, is an absolute must. So they're gonna have to come back to us one way or the other, we're not letting them go. And uh, that was not in my remarks, but I just want to put that out there. And the staff said that they would seek our committee's advice, and of course we are more than happy to provide that. Um, some of you have interest in changing lanes, and uh, I, this is a very short update, but we, uh, changing lanes is the City of Toronto's laneway housing report that had just passed Toronto East Shore Community Council. Uh, we made a formal request to Greg Younes, who is the project lead for changing lanes, and we've asked him to come to this committee to present um, the, uh, the, the, the full report and to give us a techno bre technical breakdown how this new built form in Toronto is going to be um, uh, more to, to create more accessible housing and uh, and how accessibility will be considered in their um, uh, design guidelines. So that's going to happen in the new term. Corporate accessibility report. I know this is of great interest to, to many of you. Uh, this is a report back from the executive committee. Uh, the corporate accessibility policy unifies policies uh, that address accessibilities for Ontarians with Disabilities Act and those requirements and the city's accessibility commitments uh, to this under one single umbrella. Um, this continues to be um, a body of work that has to be tracked. The policy was approved with amendments at the executive committee. Uh, the amendments requested staff to look into accessibility certification uh, pilot. Uh, Mayor Tory was referencing the Rick Hansen Foundation Accessibility uh, Certification Program when that amendment was made. Um, and I think that um, uh, we still have a long way to go, uh, despite all good intentions and a very ambitious work plan uh, from city staff. Uh, just two final updates uh, regarding festivals and outdoors because we are uh, in the festival summer season. Uh, the City of Toronto and the Province of Ontario have provided accessibility guidelines for all festivals and outdoor uh, events. Uh, many of the members here ha will recall that that uh, request originated uh, from this committee and, uh, and the City of Toronto and the Province uh, have created these guidelines largely in response uh, to, um, uh, to the request for greater accessibility inclusion for all attendees. And these uh, guidelines can be found on the City of Toronto's website. I think what we need to be mindful of is how do we ensure that the guidelines are implemented and that someone is tracking it through enforcement. Um, and then final, um, finally, uh, today marks the, the, the last TAAC uh, meeting for the term. Um, I want to thank everyone for your, for your service. Uh, members are reminded that the TA attack will be reestablished in the new term. So if you had a lot of fun and you want to come back, uh, we would certainly encourage you to reapply. And, uh, and recognizing that there are some of you who have reached your two-term limit, uh, I would welcome uh, your remarks, and uh, if you don't have to, but we welcome them uh, at the conclusion of this meeting. And at the conclusion of this meeting, of course, we're gonna provide a celebratory lunch. Okay, so um, that brings us to the end of my very lengthy chair's report. Um, sorry for that. If I can have a motion to receive the chair's report. Uh, thank you, Glenn, I appreciate that. Um, and all those in favor, any opposed? Thank you, carried. Okay, so we're moving to item number two, which, are, which is the working groups. And I know you folks have been meeting. Uh, I'm going to call for the lead of the communications working group to provide an update. Oh, sorry, Stephanie, go ahead, please. Sorry, Darren couldn't be here today. We unfortunately did not have a chance to meet before this meeting, so we don't have anything to report, but we are keeping our eye out on things. <laughs> okay, great, thank you very much. Um, we appreciate that update. The Employment Working Group, uh, we have a lead. Yes? yes, Wendy? Yes, so I'd like to report on what we have discussed as a working group. There are about three things that we've been talking about. 
Um, one is that we're really interested in understanding from today's meeting the poverty reduction strategy and the role that employment and employment of persons with disabilities can play in that and how when this committee is reassembled, um, the working group and the committee can support that role because as a committee, we're not seeing very clear links to the community of people with disabilities around employment in terms of supporting the poverty reduction strategy. And we would like to see those links made clearer. We would like to see some specific outreach made to people with disabilities. And we're not seeing that. So we're looking forward to seeing what happens in terms of the presentation today. Uh, and also a very similar point in terms of the presentation on boards and commissions. So as a committee, we were discussing the fact that boards and commissions actually provide people with disabilities with significant experience that can be used towards gaining employment. And in that light, we think that having the involvement of people with disabilities on boards and commissions should be a priority. Uh, we, and we're also not seeing that in terms of what we understand the process to be. Uh, so we're looking forward to understanding from today's presentation how we can make sure that people with disabilities are engaged in the city's boards and commissions um, and improving the representation of people with disabilities in that capacity. Uh, a third thing that we've been discussing is, and you know, it's hard to understand how much we can do at this point with what you've said, um, Councillor Wong Tam, about the committee being disassembled. Um, but we would like to see a strategy to support the employment of persons with disabilities that the City of Toronto developed. So we understand that there is an Aboriginal employment strategy that has been developed. We would like to recommend as a committee that there be a strategy to support the employment of persons with disabilities that is also developed. Um, in, in light of where we're at in terms of the calendar year and the composition of the committee and et cetera, we're not entirely sure how to move that forward. So we would really appreciate any support that any of the councillors could give us around understanding that. Is it something that we should be making a motion on, mm -hmm. for example? And can someone support yes. our committee in doing that? Okay, so perhaps we can work together. Okay. Councillor Davis and, and the committee will work together. <laughs> Councillor Davis has just pulled out her pen and I see her scribing away. <laughs> so we're on our way. So that, that is a report from the Employment Committee. But just to underline, we were having a quick conversation. As I understand it, the Executive Committee was discussing our uh, recommendations, or did not discuss, but looked at our recommendations around fostering diversity in the Toronto Public Service. Um, so this is item 35.5. And would you like, can you speak to this? <clears throat> yes, I was just sharing that yesterday at Executive, I tried to get it held and there was a miscommunication. It didn't get held. And it's quite disappointing that this report did not come here. Uh, the report on fostering diversity in the Toronto Public Service it is a report on employment equity for the City of Toronto and demonstrates um, we've made some progress, but there's a lot more work to do. And uh, one of the groups that are still, that still have a large gap in terms of representation uh, in the Toronto Public Service workforce is persons with disabilities. And um, sadly, um, there was no ability to engage with this report and it's been received mm -hmm. and it was not actionable. So I, for fifth, the 15 years that I have been here, we have been trying to establish an employment equity plan with goals and targets and a, and a proactive strategy for recruitment and we still don't have it. And this report says that they are developing strategies within each division for doing that. And I don't know how we can do this other than to send off a report to say that, request that as part of developing this diversity strategy that we have a very specific strategy for persons with disabilities. Yes, before the end, maybe we can have that motion yeah, I ready think that and, and reference this report. And I don't know why it didn't get held, nor do I know why it didn't come here. Okay. Should have. So we'll, uh, we'll come back to your motion when it's ready. And I think there's a few others uh, that are relating to different uh, working group report backs. But it's a, it's a very good catch and thank you. So I'd like to now ask the uh, housing working group uh, to report.
Uh, the Housing Working Group met on April 26th. Um, it was myself, Terry Lynn Langdon, Rahima um, Mula, and then Glenn Hart. Um, and um, I'll just read what's on the, on the short report. Uh, the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee as a whole has actively advocated for consultation prior to new shelters housing being built. However, this is not happening. The disability community must be present for all of these builds and projects, especially if they are publicly funded and accessed by city programs such as Housing Connections. People with disabilities need to be in positions of decision-making power when their services, needs, and desires are at stake. People with disabilities also need to be employed in agencies that service us. It is imperative that all new shelters and, and um, buildings include people with disabilities in their planning process from the beginning. The Housing Working Group is asking that the City of Toronto Housing Shelters and Supports come up with a plan to implement this request to the new uh, Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee in 2018-2019. Um, okay, so that um, motion was um, um, submitted by Glenn Hart. And then we have an, another motion submitted by Rahima that says um, the housing connections establish a reference group of people with disabilities to revise their medical request for a modified unit or an additional bedroom form. This form is too restrictive in its current yes no format. Uh, so the committee did review um, um, the medical request for a modified unit or additional bedroom form um, and it's quite um, medicalized and doesn't leave enough space for people to explain uh, what their particular circumstances are for their request. Um, and um, we are guessing that no one with a disability has consulted on that piece of um, paperwork. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Terry Lynn. And I know that uh, there was a recommendation coming out of the committee. Uh, the, the clerks have prepared a, a motion largely based on the uh, sort of the intention of the, um, of the, the committee. Uh, I'm going to ask the clerk to put this uh, motion on the screen. And we'll vote on everything as a package later on. Um, but I think it captures what your committee was looking for. And I will move that on your behalf, or you can move it as well. Um, so it, I, I will read it out loud, sorry. Um, so that this committee request, the executive committee request the ex general manager of shelter support and housing administration to consult with the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee in the first quarter 2019 in the development of new design guidelines that will apply to all new city funded shelter infrastructure and redevelopment. Request the general manager of shelter support and housing administration to undertake consultation on proposed changes to the application forms for rent gear to income RGI units, modified units, and additional bedroom requests with the responsible personal accessibility in Toronto Housing, our PATH committee, a resident-led group that works with Toronto Community Housing Corporation, TCHC, to improve the quality of life for people with physical disabilities. And if that, if that captures what you're looking for, um, and the intention of what the committee wanted, uh, then we would be able to vote on this uh, once, once we vote on all the motions. Well, no, I, I, I'm, yes, you can. I guess I, I was hoping that it, it did meet the, uh, the criteria of what you're looking for. Or, or, I, or I can give you the motion and you can make the changes that you're looking for and we can, re, we can reread it. Um, sorry, I feel the second one is adequate, um, but the first one, the request is specifically to make sure that folks with disabilities are involved. Not that all the plans come to us necessarily, but that people are involved from the beginning. Because I think this motion, it, like we've been requesting the first, um, we've been requesting similar things to this motion, the first motion, um, for quite some time, but as a, as a community, we're not seeing the implementation of it. There are new builds all the time without um, like access requirements. So why don't we just insert the words um, after the first sentence, uh, sorry, at the end of, uh, to consult with the Accessibility Advisory Committee and um, 
uh, appropriate stakeholders in the first quarter of 2019. Or I could leave it with you and you can wordsmith it with staff. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, so we'll withdraw that motion. You're gonna see a revised motion shortly. Sorry, Monica. Uh, Monica? I'm a little concerned about the term physical disabilities at the end of the second motion. Does that actually include all the disabilities that might mean changes to their room? Because yeah. physical can be quite defining to, to wheelchairs and scooters and things. So, I'm wondering if that includes people with visual disabilities okay. and hearing disabilities as okay. well. Thank you very much for the comment. I think when Terry Ann Lillian is finished with her edits, uh, I'll place that motion back in front of staff who will make sure that what your, what your comment uh, is also taken into consideration so the motion will reflect the will of this committee. Okay, thank you. Anyone else before I, I'm sorry if I'm jumping too far ahead. Okay. Um, so thank you very much, Terry Lynn. We'll come back to that motion. Uh, we will now hear from the Transportation Working Group and we have a lead. Um, yeah, we met on Sunday evening um, and uh, we focused mainly on the presentation from the, the Wheeltrans people that is happening today. Um, and uh, we have lots of questions around the presentation handout that we received ahead of time. And so we're looking forward to that to see um, if some of those can be answered. Um, Terry Lynn is going through the appeals process right now, and, um, and so she has some uh, focused questions based on that um, that we'll bring up during the presentation. And we also have the possibility of a couple of um, motions coming out of that, depending on what information we get from the presentation. Um, and um, this is our last meeting, so we decide not to bring any new items up because things can change between now and, and after the election, so we thought it, we wanted to make sure we saw what was happening before we brought anything else forward. Um, and that's basically it. Okay, Monica, thank you. We do have motions prepared based on the, uh, the comments from your committee. Uh, if, if the clerks can make sure that, have you seen it yet? No, but um, they spoke to us and, and Carol spoke to me okay, and, and said that we're gonna wait until after the presentation Un to see. Understood, yeah. okay, so thank you. Mm -hmm. um, if we can just make sure that Monica has a copy, uh, so if there's any changes, we will get them made quickly. Okay, thank you very much, Monica, for your, um, your update. And can we please hear from the lead of the Disability and Policing Working Group? Um, hello. Um, because of the upcoming elections in October, um, we cannot hold the forum that we've been planning on the Disability uh, Policing uh, Working Group um, this, for this um, election period. But we can do something in the first or second quarter of uh, 2019 um, to really open up that discussion because it is important to us and we have been working on it. Thank you very much, Terry Lynn. Um, so what we will do, I think, uh, because I, I see that Terry Lynn is still working on the motion, so let's not rush that, but why don't we just hold uh, the amendments that were coming, or the motions that were coming out of the working groups. We're gonna hold this down, we are gonna come back to it, uh, but to not delay the agenda, we will start with the presentations on DI 20.3, City of Toronto Public Appointments. I wanna welcome Aretha Phillips, the Manager of Public Appointments, City Clerk's Office, who will be here to provide us with a presentation. Welcome. Uh, you're going to the front of the room? Okay, thanks, Aretha. Uh, so that, uh, so Aretha and her team are not quite ready, so we're going to hold that down. You folks take the time that you need to set up properly. Uh, we are going to move to TI, uh, sorry, DI 20.4, wheel trans. Uh, uh, sorry, which, which matter? So, so we're not actually dealing with that right now. We're, we're just jumping ahead and we're going to come back to it. 
You want, um, can you, uh, we're gonna, sorry, I'd rather than having a conversation across a big room, why don't you come and speak to, to the clerk or we'll come and have a conversation with you. Um, we are gonna proceed to, um, are Wheeltrans staff here, uh, TTC staff? Okay, great, so you're here to present. So hang on tight, we're gonna come back to number three. We're going to proceed with number four. Okay. Are we here, to, uh, are we doing number three or number four? Number, oh, we're moving for number three, okay. So why don't we hear the, uh, the staff presentation, then we'll hear from um, Miguel, and then we'll bring it into committee for, for questions. Sorry, but it, the order just got a little bit varied. But I think we're nimble, we'll, we'll make it work. Okay, sorry about that, you okay? Okay, go ahead please. Our apologies for that uh, slight delay. Thank you for your patience, it's technical difficulties, but uh, we are back on track. I wanted to say first, thank you everyone for allowing us to um, present this morning on public appointments and our outreach strategies and identifying um, barriers to participation for the disability community. Um, there's quite a few familiar faces that I know in the audience, uh, so I'm very happy to be here again. My name is Aretha Phillip, and I'm the manager of public appointments. So a couple of things that we're going to talk about today are um, our current diversity stats around for persons with disabilities and public appointments. I'll give you a bit of an overview around the upcoming public appointments for 2019 and then a bit of some discussion around identifying potential barriers to participation for the community and as well as helping to identify strategies that we can engage um, people with disabilities uh, in public appointments. At the meeting in October 25th, uh, where my colleague Matthew delivered a presentation about public appointments, it was an overview presentation, um, and I know there was two pieces that you wanted us to come back to, which are those ones we will discuss after I go through uh, a few things. So one of the things that we talk about uh, in public appointments and just as a guiding principle with the city is that we talk about a city, the city of Toronto as a city of neighborhoods, but it's really important for us to be able to reflect the needs and interests in our large city, especially on our agencies, boards and committees. Um, we know it's important to appreciate the perspectives of all of our residents um, and that obviously includes everyone in this room. I think for us, one of the challenges for us is, you know, how do we make sure that we find people who can present those diverse opinions on our agencies, boards, and committees? Um, and I think for me, I see that as a challenge and also as an opportunity. So one of the things in terms of our public appointments uh, process is that when candidates complete um, the application, we have included a, complement, a confidential voluntary diversity sur information survey, um, and that's how we, what we use to collect demographic information about our applicants. We collect this information for two reasons. One, um, it really helps us to achieve our objectives around access, equity, and diversity in our process. It also helps us monitor how well we are doing um, and what improvements can be made. Um, and then how we can then look at targeted outreach strategies to ensure that we get applicants with, from those communities to participate. And also looking at how we uh, remove any barriers to participation. Um, one of the questions that we ask on the survey is to help us identify persons with disabilities, so there is a, a question around that. This information also helps us, is presented to the nominating panels when they're going through the selection process as to what are the different diversity um, within the candidates who have come forward. So it helps in their decision making as well. And I say that that means all things being equal um, to, to if we have the opportunities to appoint diverse candidates that we look to that. So just a little bit of stats around uh, how we're doing with the persons with disabilities community in terms of our applications to appointments. So as of February 5th, 2018, uh, this term of council, 6.9% uh, of our applicants identified as a person with a disability. 
Of that 6.9, 6.8% of the appointees uh, were persons with disabilities. So looking at the census data that we have, the most recent from 2016, um, the person with disability community makes up 12.8% of the city of Toronto. So we're doing well in terms of applicants to appointments. We're probably not doing, we're not doing quite as well if we look at compared to the census data to 12.8. So we have some work to do. So definitely there's opportunity room for improvement um, and knowing that we need to do some more work in uh, reaching out to qualified applicants who identify as having a, a, a disability. Now I'd say probably that these stats, uh, the 6.9 of applicants, probably come majority from this particular committee. What we don't have is a lot of uh, persons from the community applying to other opportunities outside of this. So we need to do some work on changing that to making sure that there's some representation across the other areas of our agencies, boards, and tribunals. So I would say um, we come to you as well because we need your help in identifying who those, those people who might be uh, ready to, to sit on different boards and, and willing to do that type of work. Um, our hope is that obviously the more applications that we receive from the community, the more opportunity that there is in the selection pool to actually appoint. So a couple of things about how we do that, uh, and Matt might have gone over this in the last presentation. We do do considerable, considerable targeted outreach. Uh, in any of the appointments that come forward, we take a look at the diversity data that we have within that pool of applicants to take a look at where the potential gaps might be um, in terms of representation on the board. We then outreach to those communities, targeted outreach to those communities to encourage applications. So these are some of the organizations that we work with uh, quite a bit. Um, the Ability Magazine, uh, we Volunteer Toronto, People in Motion, we were just there last week talking about our appointments, uh, diversity on board. Um, we also work with our internal divisions who are working with the, the community to find out if they can send out that information or if they know of anyone in the community that might be somebody that we could approach. I think we've trying to go away from the just put in your application and the wait to see what happens. We're doing a lot more proactive outreach, talking to people specifically, reaching out to communities so that we can get that uh, depth of pool increased. This is an area though definitely we would love to hear from you uh, regarding which, which organizations and media outlets that we should be engaging in to, to better reach uh, the, the, the community. And again, we're always open and very interested in new strategies for engagement. So coming up in 2019 with the new term of council, we're going to have over 250 positions on our city boards. Um, we'll be starting that recruitment uh, with our outreach campaign in the, the late fall, early winter, um, so that we can increase the number of applicants who apply. If anyone has applied previously, we have a three-year retention on applications, so if anyone has applied before three years, you need to, to resubmit. Um, so along with a general awareness campaign, letting people know about the opportunities, we also target, as I mentioned, campaigns uh, specifically to communities. So we will be doing a campaign to outreach to the uh, disability community. We accept applications on an ongoing basis so people can apply at any time uh, for any of our opportunities. Um, when people are applying, when candidates are applying, um, our offices, and they might be experiencing any difficulties, our office is always open to speak to any applicants about the application process, talk them through what information they could possibly put on there. So we will do that work to help them present themselves in the best way possible. Um, and again, providing any assistance that's necessary. Um, it is one of our policies, obviously as a city, to provide accommodations uh, to participate and that goes from everything from the application process to the interview process to ultimately if you get on an agency board or committee. That's important to know. Um, we want to ensure that anybody who serves on one of our agencies, boards or committees that you have a great experience. We see you as an ambassador to our program and we want to make sure that you do then tell other people about the experience that you had. So anything that we can do to make that a good experience while you are with us is, is very important. So two things that we quickly wanted to discuss was um, which came out of the, uh, the previous meeting was there was some questions about um, for us to understand some of potentially barriers that 
applicants might have to participating uh, in the process. So it would be great to be able to hear some of that to help us break down those barriers and again provide um, a good experience for potential applicants. Again, we offer the accommodations um, and we also plan to include a question on our applications moving forward, asking people to identify what potentially what types of accommodations they might need. I feel like us putting that out there right front and center shows an openness uh, to uh, providing that information, providing those services to people. So I don't know if we wanted to take, how you wanted to do that, take a few seconds, maybe two, a few minutes to identify what people see as barriers and how we could improve the process. Okay, thank you very much, Aretha, for the presentation. Uh, we're going to hold down the questions uh, at this particular point. I know that uh, there is a member of the public who would like to speak to this matter, so if you can um, uh, maybe just return to the area where you were sitting, and we're going to call you right back. Okay, perfect. Okay, so thank you very much, and thanks for that presentation. And we will all um, lock it into the vote that there are uh, two questions before us that are being asked of staff to, uh, to have open discussions on. So we don't have a speaker's list, but I, I suspect that we have a speaker. There you go. Okay, so um, Miguel, uh, uh, Miguel Avila. Okay, okay. so just because I don't have a speaker's list, that's why. But we know each other, so welcome. Uh, I'm going to set your time, and you've got five minutes. Uh, is, is this working? The overhead, yeah? Uh, it will be working for you shortly. Okay. Hang on tight. All right. My name is Miguel Avila, for those who don't know me. Um, I've been an um, active member in the community of Regent Park and in the city of, Gen of Toronto in general, uh, speaking about disability issues, police brutality, et cetera, et cetera. Housing. Um, since 2009, I lost my job at the Toronto Zoo. Um, I have been, become an active member here at the City Hall and since 2010, I have submitted my application for several board positions. Uh, number one, my former employer, the Toronto Zoo, I submitted my application, it's a free position. And over the years, I have received uh, emails from uh, appointments committee consultants, sorry, there are many consultants over the years, saying, you know, well, we keep the application every three years, and each application I submitted, I submit my resumes. So I believe if since you are honest to say that you keep my application for three years, you have a record of my resumes. So if, if Ms. Phyllis, you have always argued that my resumes are not completed, I will suggest you to go back to 2010 when I submitted my first application for the Toronto Zoo Board, for the Toronto Police Services, for the TTC, and for the Toronto Community Housing Corporation, four agencies that I have a heart and interest to change from inside out because you require someone external who live in experiences like myself, who have been treated badly by the system, to change the, the minds, the, to change their attitudes towards people with mental disabilities and addictions. I, I will strongly advise to these committee members who are planning to attend um, um, City Hall in July the 1st to be, to be um, aware that they're gonna be searching your bags, they're going to be searching everything you go come into City Hall. It's unfortunate that yesterday only five members of the public came to speak on this matter, but then no one from the Disability Committee came to speak. How are we going to deal with people with disabilities as they enter City Hall? Um, the, the, city, the city security manager said that they will take 3.8 seconds to screen each individual that comes in City Hall. But you and I, you know that people with disabilities have uh, uh, support services they have, etc. Nobody spoke on this matter, so I will ask someone from this committee to please send a letter to a city uh, mayor on item 3.3.5, 35.3, enhanced security measures at Toronto City Hall. We, the disability people, we are going to be target. So please, I strongly advise you. I'm looking at uh, uh, Terry Len um, as chair of the police action group um, to incorporate that in a letter to, to argue that uh, this, these measures will be drastically uh, um, in, 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 not in our favor. So also want to relate to um, um, 
I have have a hard in, intentions to I have have intentions to become part of this committee as well. And 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 again, I'm going back to Ms. Phillips. I have, I I talked to her last time. My disability application, my resume since I lost my job at the Toronto Zoo has been activism. My my life is on the newspapers. My life is in social media. So all my good work is out there. And I sent to you all the links of my work. And you said I didn't have the time to go through all of them because that doesn't fit the criteria, but come on, you had to start to think out of the box. You had to understand how we, people who live on the streets, who get brutalized by police or, and, and, and harassed by the system feel. And that's how we express ourselves. And, and, and you had to understand my way. That is not the way of everybody. I don't, Miguel, I, I'm, not Miguel I'm sorry to interrupt you, Miguel. If you can address your comments to me as the chair. Yeah, because you, Thank you know, you. You are allowing the status quo to go on and on. We had to step up out of the box again. We had to say, you know what? If we are really serious about changing the attitude of our elected officials, Doug Ford has said that he's going to support the police, and they're going to, he's going to support financially our, uh, our, our police services in Ontario. So that is going to be drastically adverse to us who are members of the disability, com disability uh, community. So I, we have to have representation at the Toronto Police Services Board. That's the only thing I want to advise this committee. Please Thanks. ensure that we have a member of the disability committee at the board so that they understand Thank you for time. your time. Thank you very much for your Thank comment. You. There may, Thank be, you. There may be questions for you. Are there any questions for the speaker? I'm here 24 hours. See, thank you. Um, our next speaker is Emily Daigle. That's what it's for. <laughs> hey guys, you all know me. So simply civic appointments, I'm gonna stay really tightly on topic. Um, I've tried to apply three times for different things. I applied for the TTC board, um, public positions, but there's qualifications. There's qualifications with almost every board and committee. I've looked at quite a few of them over the years. Um, and I will admit, this is the only one I've actually done the full application for because all the others, the qualifications scared me off. And I'm probably not the only one that the qualifications part of it scares off people. So a lot of people with disabilities, unless they're very lucky, a lot of us don't have these qualifications. Unless you've been blessed in life and have a great education and a great upbringing, you may not be able to meet these qualifications that are set out. I'd love to have the qualifications, but when so many of the committees have them, or the committees are about places that are inaccessible to us and are held at inaccessible locations, how do we bother to join or want to apply? Like, I for one would love to be part of the Toronto Zoo Committee, but the problem is Toronto Zoo, I can't afford to go. So I don't know what's going on, even though I love the zoo and I support it deeply. It's like I'd love to be on the CNE, um, sorry, Exhibition Place Committee. Don't have the qualifications, it's held down there. Not an easy area to get around. And that's one of the reasons why people in motion moved to Verity Village. One of the places you're not accessing that would be really great for you guys to access, to access people with disabilities, is places like March of Dimes, SCI Ontario, Abilities Expo. I was just an ambassador for People in Motion and I've also volunteered for Abilities Expo. I've also volunteered for a lot of other places. One of the major parts we're missing in the appointments process is when you go on the website and it has all these requirements and the other question is, it doesn't really tell you exactly what your hours will be. And for some of us, we have bookings at home. 
For some of us, we have commitments that must be made, such as medical or independent living PSWs coming and helping you. The other problem is, is a lot of these, this website, and I'm gonna be speaking on it, but the website is very difficult to navigate at the best of times, especially if you use a mobile device with a screen reader on it, such as VoiceOver or Google Talk, uh, TalkBack. Thank you very much, and I appreciate the staff presentation because it's something that I'm very involved in is working and helping our city become the great city it can be for everyone. That's one of the reasons why I fought so hard for this table and one of the reasons why I fight so hard to get people to work for elections because Toronto elections is something that is great and it's not just part of the appointments process that we need to be part of, it's the whole city. Thank you very much. Emily, thank you very much for your comments. Are there any questions for Emily? Okay, Emily, thank you. Um, oh, sorry, I, I, sorry, Emily, don't go away. Uh, Rahima actually has a question for you. Okay. Thank you for your presentation, Emily. You mentioned you were scared in the application process. Could you please elaborate? I'm scared. What scared me off applying for a couple of them was the qualifications and just the fact that they start talking about all these degrees and all these different apparent educational things you need. And some of it's quite scary for those of us that have never had the chance to go to a higher education. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Emily. Um, we're going to now go back to the portion where we are, uh, the staff have made requests for us to have a, converse, uh, a discussion about uh, two uh, points that have been uh, flagged. And I don't know if the, per uh, yeah, great, thank you. If you can just proceed back to the front of the room. I suspect, uh, especially after hearing the, the presentations from the public, uh, that the committee will probably have some very good advice for you. And I hope that you have also been taking notes as the members of the public were speaking. I saw you doing that, so thank you. Okay, so questions of staff right now. Uh, Yin, please go ahead. Uh, considering the comments that were just made, are there any possibilities of having the qualifications um, broadened to, to um, to consider the uh, consumer, uh, the end user of some of these uh, city city facilities and and services, so that um, as as Emily have said that you know maybe we don't have or the people from the disability community may not have the uh, professional you know knowledge and skill sets, but they are the end users. So that's one question, and outreach. Um, I, I see, I, I know Aretha and Robin, you know, very well from the Elections Toronto group. There's, they can use the same um, communities that they've, out, they've used, you know, to outreach to them in, 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 uh, in disseminating information about recruitment because, you know, for me, I have not seen any of them and I'm pretty connected <laughs> even on this committee. So if I missed it, I'm sure a lot of people in the disability community have never seen anything unless they actively, you know, go to the city's website. The third question is, um, years ago there was a special forum um, for to recruit women uh, for the agency boards and committees. Uh, there was a special evening of two, three hours, you know, committed to that, uh, where where um, lots of information were given. Uh, so I, I'm thinking maybe a similar format can be done, where we we even have a specific. Uh, night or oh, meeting and, and TAAC will help to spread the information so that there can be an information session for this com the disability community. So these are uh, ideas but also questions to say can these be implemented? Okay, thank you very much, Yen. Um, Aretha, would you like to comment on that? 
Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you for the suggestions because I think that they're very helpful in us looking to improve our, our process. Um, we are, have been looking at identifying the time commitment because we want to be clear about the expectations. So we are looking at our, uh, currently we call them the decision body profiles, but the board profiles to see that we can better explain what's involved when meetings are, what prep work, what post work you have to do so that people really understand the nature of the, the commitment. Um, in regards to the website, um, that's good information for us. Um, our understanding was that, that it was accessible, but hearing that means we need to take go back, take a look at it and make sure that it we are, um, people can, are able to navigate it with, with all the different devices, that's important. So we will definitely make that a, pro a priority. The qualifications, um, those qualifications are identified through council, they're approved by council. It's something that we can take a look at, but I did want to identify in the application process, we look at the in entire application, everything is equally weighted. It's also based on you identifying why you want to serve the city, why this particular opportunity is important for you. That's something that we want to understand why people want to serve. So that's all, the, all those questions are equally weighted. We also ask about, as someone mentioned, your um, educational background. We also, again, ask about education, uh, your professional development and as well we ask about your community involvement so you don't have to be a star in all of those areas it's about the collective of those different experiences that you bring so someone may have a great um, great experience in community involvement which would um, be an important criteria that we would look at which would bring you forward I will say um, if people are need any help and assistance with their application, our office can do that. So we always have the time to have those conversations. Um, if somebody wants to send or has the idea to send their resume or can't navigate the system and needs that help, we will help you extract the information that you need uh, to put that into your application. Things like websites and video links are a little bit more difficult, um, but we are able to help you fill out the application and we're always open to doing that. So no one ever gets turned away and we do find the time to assist in that regard. Okay, thank you very much, Ian. Um, Ian, do you have a follow-up question before I move along to another uh, member of the committee? So what about that, um, what was it, the, the, the sort of a, a set-aside meeting to, oh, sorry, yes. to, to, to specifically inform the disability community and the idea of um, broadening your outreach to, to include those that probably was, were on the election Toronto list? Yes. So yes, I think the idea of the info session is something that would be great for us to look at in the fall uh, to identify um, the various opportunities and connect um, the community with uh, the process and with the know about it and providing assistance that's needed. I think that's something that we can definitely take away. We understand every single engagement is not the best for each community. We have to find different ways to, to engage communities which, is, which work best for them. So definitely I think that's something that we, we could take a look at. And as for the AON, I know we have sent out things through the AON, uh, but more will be coming um, in the fall when we've got the, the, the bulk of the recruitments coming up. Thank you very much. Uh, Monica next, and then Wendy. Um, just to elaborate, hi. <laughs> um, just to elaborate on um, the equal weighting of all the uh, pieces, is that clearly stated at the top of the application? Because if they don't know that, then they're going to see the qualifications for professional needs and go, well, I don't have that, and just stop, mm -hmm. right? So it might be good to have that clarified at the very top. Um, so that they know that even if they don't have a degree, that their community involvement, et cetera, will be also considered as equal weight. I think that's a good point, and I want to just touch on that a little bit. In some in many of the instances of our boards, uh, corporations, some of the others, they're looking for very specific skill sets because these groups of people are providing strategic direction to the management of that entity. So in some cases, I want to manage expectations. In some cases, you have to have those the skills and qualifications. That is the nature of the agency. Um, so that's, but in some, in other areas where there might be a little bit more room, definitely, I think we can do something to identify uh, that for people. Thank you very much. Um, Wendy. Thank you to all those very important. Thank you for your presentation. I wanted to ask a couple of questions about your outreach. Um, can you clarify for me, is it Ability Magazine that you outreach to or Abilities? 
And the reason I ask is Ability Magazine, the one that you have listed on your presentation, is an American publication. There is a Canadian publication called Abilities Magazine, um, but I'm not sure which one it is that you're outreaching to. Sorry, I think that's a mistake. It is the Abilities Magazine, okay, which we have done, is. so my apologies. Okay. And in terms of uh, just broadening out the connections within the city to participants that could potentially be interested, um, a lot of my work has to do with people who live with episodic disabilities. So we're talking about people who are living with HIV, uh, mental health conditions, um, MS, things that relapse and remit. Uh, do you have any outreach to organizations like the MS Society or the Arthritis Society or any of the mental health organizations that exist in the city? We have done some, but we can do do more. I think what we will do is is reach out to our colleagues in elections, as as, Ma, as the Ian had suggested, to make sure that we are definitely sending out the information. So we don't have that. that I think we're looking, obviously, for the community to provide us with that information. So these are great um, uh, great organizations that we can reach out to. We are open to doing that. We just need some assistance in figuring out where the best place is for us to go, where where the community is. Can I? Just as a follow-up comment, because the City of Toronto obviously funds and engages with a number of community organizations that support people living with these kinds of conditions mm -hmm. or disabilities. So even outside of the elections uh, group, there's probably other organizations that the city liaises with that would be in a position to support um, letting people know about these kinds of positions being available. So in, in, from my capacity, I'm thinking about the support that you provide to organizations like ACT you know, and, and places like the 519 Community Centre and, and other organizations that could also be looped in. So have a broad lens is what I'm suggesting. Also, is there a way of getting in touch? I know that this committee is being dis, uh, disentangled, disengaged at the end of this meeting, but I would certainly be willing to give you a list of people that I work with in the city that would be um, valuable in terms of your outreach. No, I think that's a great comment. So outside of elections, we also engage with Parks, Forest and Recreation, SDFA, Public Health. We do ex extend that uh, information to them to help us connect with their constituents. We do do that. It could be maybe better, but I'm definitely open to a conversation with you to, to um, get those organizations and get them on our radar. Yeah, and this is my final follow-up comment, but I also, as a person with a disability who's quite well connected, um, and so I'm not just connected within the disability community, but within the community of people um, who support people living with HIV, so this is a big community, right? I have not seen anything come to me in any official capacity ever about the boards and commissions. So I know about this committee because I looked at the website. In terms of outreach, I think there's a long way to go, unfortunately, and in terms of representation, you're at half what the population representation is. So I actually think there's a long way to go. I, I agree with you. We, there is more work to be done. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, next to question is Wendy, then Terry Lynn. Wendy. Yeah, okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, Kristen is in, in the clouds. Um, and now back, to, back on, on planet Earth. Uh, Terry Lynn, go ahead, please. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I also sought this committee out and I'm also fairly connected and I've never seen anything within any of the jobs that I've had or, or um, volunteer or community-based roles that I've had um, come across in terms of agencies, boards and commissions. Um, I also wanted to support Emily's comment about, there's a caveat though. Um, you know, I think approaching employment resource groups that support folks with disabilities is actually an excellent idea. Where I have like kind of a reserved, strained opinion about that is those folks are clearly looking for paid employment. Um, however, there are people um, that will view these kinds of opportunities as maybe um, an option to sort of get them into the paid roles that they, they are seeking. So I do support yes. that um, that um, initiative or an initiative like that. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Terry Lynn. Anyone else? Uh, before I go back to you, Monica, because you've already spoken, let me acknowledge Michael and then Stephanie. Anyone else? And then Councillor Davis, and then I'm coming back to you and we're going to wrap up there. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Just a couple of quick comments. Just off of Wendy's comment about the 519, it's an AOC, and apparently there's a whole bunch of other AOCs like 
Apple Grove, Central Eglinton, and th that's one of those things where, and you know, I'm sort of tying it to what Emily was saying, you've got the high profile boards like the TTC, but you've got these AOCs that are always looking for people though, and that's where I think you can sort of tap into some of those communities as well, and I think they're oftentimes overlooked. The other two comments very quickly as well is that sometimes you, you've got the public appointments website, but it's not sort of cross leveraged to other organizations. So say if somebody's looking for shelter support, it would be good if there was a link for public appointments on there, or if they're looking for wheel-trans, a link for public appointments there. The last thing that I'll also say very quickly is traveling with wheel-trans on the wheel-trans bus. Sometimes how I found out about events like uh, people in motion is because there would be posters on the wheel-trans bus. That would be one way to reach out to people with disabilities very easily. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Michael, for your comment. Uh, Stephanie? Thank you. Um, I'd like to go back to the application process, and I really appreciate that you do assist people who need help with the application process. But I'd like to sort of go back to the drawing board and say, can, can you go back and develop an application process that is through an inclusive lens? So rather than it being an add-on that for people who need help uh, in the disability community, yes, we will help you. How about it being designed in a way that people can independently use the system and apply with as minimal help or no help at all because it's designed for them to be able to use it. So for example, I know for people who are culturally deaf and use American Sign Language, they would need someone to come and either interpret what's on the, on the form for them or come to your office or for that kind of open communication. If there was an, a tab with an ASL translation of it, they can access that information directly. And also, if there was a way that they can respond to you through ASL, um, there, in today's age, there's all kinds of technology where people can leave video messages back to you with their responses, and, and, and you will have the answers, but it's in the language that that person needs to communicate it. And also, sorry, just another add-on is about um, plain language as well. If you could revisit it in ensure it's in a format that is plain language and clear communication, that would be really appreciated. Thank you. That was good comments. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Stephanie, Councillor Davis, and then Monica, and we will conclude this item. Um, I've just drafted uh, a couple of motions, and I just want to check that you'll be able to, um, to do those. The first um, has to do, or the second has to do with convening uh, a potential session similar to what Yin talked about. Uh, previously held f to target women, that this you could convene some kind of a special session targeted to the disabilities community to increase the pool of applicants uh, for the 2018-22 uh, appointments process. Um, and the second is to request that you review the qualifications um, with the goal of um, increasing the representation of persons with disabilities. Um, I know, having been the chair of the appointments process, that that policy um, requires particular qualifications for, for certain committees. I know that. The quasi-judicial boards, where you need somebody who has uh, training and experience um, hearing, with hearings and uh, rendering decisions, writing decisions, those are uh, uh, very uh, specialized skills. But there are other boards, and I like Michael's uh, example of the other advisory committees um, where we really could be providing kind of entry point uh, uh, experiences for people who have lived experience to be part of uh, a board. So uh, are you reporting at all to council in the next term uh, to look at the qualifications or any other changes in the appointments 
policy, the public appointments policy? I think that's something that we have talked about mm -hmm. around the qualifications because they haven't been looked at for a very long time, as you all know, Councillor Davis. Uh, it's not going to happen, obviously, before the end of this right. term. We've only got one month. But it is something that is on our radar for the next term of Council to take a look at that and see what modifications can be made and changes. It's so we have reviewed the public appointments policy, mm -hmm. I think, once, once. since 2000. And we made six. some changes in 2014, some changes. Right. So are you considering any other changes that would this could go along with to bring back any kind of a review of the public appointment? I think that's something we can look at. We have looked at the, pub, the, the a policy, and there definitely needs to be some consolidation, some changes to it. Okay. So I think that's something that we would look to do in the new term of council. OK. So would you be OK with those motions? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <Okay>. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Monica, last speaker. Thank you. Um, cut one comment first on Stephanie's thing, just to clarify for people. Um, people who communicate through ASL do not necessarily have a good um, un understanding of English. I get emails on a regular basis from people who are ASL fluent and their second language is English and it can look quite grammatically wrong right. because ASL is very different grammatically than in English is and that's something that should be kept in mind when receiving applications because it may not, it may not speak to their education, it will speak to their communication in English. So that's something to keep in mind. The other question I have is have you guys considered Volunteer Toronto? Yes, we do. You do use them. Okay, all right, perfect. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much. I will ask for speakers. I know that Councillor Davis has a motion. Anyone else? And uh, Councillor Davis, uh, please go ahead. Actually, these were both Ian's um, ideas, and so I've captured them, and I'm going to read them, but uh, the motion is going to be moved on her behalf and she can speak to it. Okay, great, thank you. That the executive committee requests the city manager in consultation with the city clerk to review the candidate qualifications for agency boards, commissions, and corporations contained in the public appointments policy with the goal of reducing barriers and increasing participation of persons with disabilities in the qualified pool for consideration in the civic appointments process. Um, and the second one is for the executive committee to request the city clerk to organize a special information session targeted to the disability community as a means of outreach and recruitment to increase representation of persons with disabilities in the 2018 to 2022 City of Toronto appointments process. Thank you very much, oh, Councillor. Those are your motions. Yeah. Yin, would you like to speak to the motions? Thank you very much, Councillor, for reading them. Oh, I'm surprised I worded it so well. <laughs> I'd just like to add maybe um, to, to, uh, f for the uh, f recruitment or outreach to the, to the widest possible um, disability community, you know, so that to capture Wendy's point that we're not just targeting, you know, one or two major groups, but that um, episodic and other um, disability diversity groups are included. Thank you very much, Ian, for that further comment. And I believe that Councillor Davis is now working with clerks to wordsmith that. Anyone else who'd like to speak on this uh, matter? No? Okay. No, you don't get to speak again. Sorry. <laughs> you, you, you can thank the committee for their, their comments if you like. Uh, oh, sorry, Michael. Michael, I apologize. I didn't see your there. Go ahead. Okay, I was just going to say maybe the one word that we could add is early period. So I know it's quite broad, 2018 to 2020, 2018 to 2022, but to have it actually happen in the earlier part of the session. Thank you. I don't know if they actually heard you. There was a request from Michael to see if this can um, if this can take place as, as early as possible in, in the in the new term. So maybe we put in the words as early as possible in 2019. Uh, Michael, just to clarify, was that a request for part one or part two of the motion? Okay, for both, please. Okay, so the clerks will just make that quick adjustment, um, but essentially, um, 
Essentially, essentially, the motion moved by Yin uh, is has now become stronger, and I think much more direct with respect to action. Rather than waiting for the clerks to put everything on the screen, in the interest of time, uh, if there are no questions of the motion, if there's nobody else interested in speaking, uh, we are ready for a vote. Okay. I just want to thank staff for coming forward for the presentation. I recognize that the work is, uh, is rather difficult. I think you got a lot of rich feedback from the committee today. They're not entirely satisfied, as you can tell, uh, but we know that you're up for the challenge, and we'll look forward to hearing back from you in the, in the new term. Um, all those in favor of the motion? Any opposed? That carries. Thank you very much. Uh, so our, our next item is DI 20.4, uh, Wheel Trans Appeals Process. And I think before we actually hear from staff, um, oh, there is no, there's no speech. okay, sorry. Um, just backspace and delete all that I was just about to say. Uh, we're gonna hear from TTC staff. Um, we are going to receive a presentation from uh, Aslin O'Hara, the Project Lead Customer Service, Wheel Trans. TTC, as well as Londen Hassan, Assistant Manager, Customer Services, Wheel Trans of the TTC, and they're going to give us an update on the appeal process. This is okay. Thank you. Can I ask that someone also drop that desk? Is that possible? Yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay. No, that's okay, Emily. I just want to be able to see the people behind the desk. <laughs> so. Thank you. We'll, we'll raise it back up for you at the next item. Um, so just, we're going to do a quick time check because I think item number one took a little bit longer than we had anticipated. Not to rush you folks, but I know you've got a, a, a good presentation, um, but I think we're going to allocate about five minutes to your presentation if you can p pack it all in there. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Okay, great. I'm going to get started. Is that okay? So um, my name is Ashlyn O'Hara and I am the project lead for customer experience for Wheeltrans and I'm here presenting with you today um, with Loden Hassan who is our assistant manager of customer service. So Loden runs the entire uh, customer service department at Wheeltrans and also here today we also have Eve Wiggins uh, just sitting behind Monica here and she is the head of Wheeltrans. Um, thank you so much for having us here. Uh, we really do find it to be an honor to come and connect and present and hear your feedback. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Again, as Ashton said, I'm Loden Hassan. I run the uh, customer service uh, department in Wheeltrans uh, TTC, and I'm here presenting today per your request. So we'll start with a little bit of history on our eligibility. Um, prior to January 1st, 2017, all of our customers were required to have a physical disability to be able to be approved for our service. And they're also required the use of a mobility device and to be able to attend an in-person interview. As of January 1st, 2017, uh, per AODA, the new eligibility changes that were made were that all disabilities will be recognized and all disabilities can apply and there's three different levels of uh, disability that we now recognize. The first one being conditional, which means when a person has a disability but is unable to take conventional transit some of the time or all of the time. The second uh, category would be unconditional. This speaks to customers who have a disability or are, and are unable to take conventional transit 100% of the time. So they're dedicated wheel trans users. Uh, the third being temporary, and this speaks to a person who has a disability and is unable to take conventional transit for a temporary period of time, therefore needing our services. So when we had to make these changes uh, in January 1st of 2017, uh, Wheeltrans did not take these changes lightly. So we had to go from having all customers attend an in-person interview to uh, changing it to a paper-based application form that required both the applicant and the healthcare professional to complete a portion. So in designing this process, Wheeltrans did not do this alone. We met extensively for over a year with over 1,500 different stakeholders to hear their feedback and develop a comprehensive eligibility process that also included appeals. 
we have designed the exact same application, the exact same appeal form and appeal process as all of the GTHA specialized transit providers. That's Greater Toronto Hamilton Area. So that would include, for example, York Region, Mobility Plus, Peel Region, TransHelp, et cetera. So we essentially, we didn't do this alone. We met with the medical community and also had a huge involvement from our ACAT, which is the Accessible or Advisory Committee for Accessible Transit with the TTC. Uh, another point is that um, applications did require uh, more information. So some of our applications are, some. You know, every situation can be different. So not every disability fits perfectly into different categories and different boxes. So sometimes when there's more information that is needed, we will send a certain that those applications for an in-person assess an in-person assessment with Sunnybrook Health Services. And that's completed by an occupational therapist. And basically it's just a, a an assessment to see what the person's abilities are and to see what level of wheel trans would best match their service. So the next slide is to share a little bit of statistics with you guys, because who doesn't love numbers? Uh, 2017, wheel trans received 13,360 applications. Of those, 12,689 12, received eligibility, 209 were ineligible, 7,813 were found to be conditional. Uh, 3,175 received temporary eligibility with us, and 1,494 customers received unconditional eligibility. And of the uh, 13,360, 613 were sent to functional assessments. And of those 613, we had 10 appeals, which equates to about less than 1% of our total application. Uh, results in, in an appeal? Our appeal process involves the applicant uh, submitting an appeal form. Uh, they also then would be scheduled for an in-person uh, functional assessment. So basically, if during your application process you went for a functional assessment, you don't have to do another one for the appeal. But if you didn't do one, then you will be requested to do one before you meet with the panel. The rationale for that, and again, that's the same way that they do it almost across Ontario for all specialized transit providers, and the reason for that is maybe we got it wrong. Maybe we didn't have all the information we needed on the application form. Sometimes uh, our applicants we've discovered won't, won't list all their disabilities necessarily. So the purpose of sending for that functional assessment is to ensure that we've really done our due diligence for that customer and that applicant and that we're not denying them just based off of a paper form. We want to really uh, get more information before we proceed to the appeal. The appeal panel has three members. I'll just flip to the next slide here, the, which includes an occupational therapist, which is different from the person who did the assessment, a TTC transit expert, who's one of the, um, a pool of assistant managers that know exactly the challenges and barriers that can be faced on different routes and divisions across the TTC, and a community member with a disability who uses public transit. And I'm just going back one slide now. The appeal panel interview is approximately 30 minutes. Uh, the applicant can bring a person with them for support. Uh, the appeal panel's decision is final. So Wheeltrans does not have the ability to change those decisions. It's made independently and we accept that as final. Um, we try to communicate that within 14 days after the appeal interview. Uh, more statistics. So average wait time for appeals to be booked generally with an appeal panel is seven days. Uh, Ten appeals were conducted in 2017 out of the 13,360 received applications. Seven appeals conducted this far this year out of uh, 5,511 received applications. That's 17 total appeals to date from January 1st, 2017. Um, five appeals over, were overturned. We'll, or we overturned Wheeltrans original decision, and 12 appeals upheld Wheeltrans original decision, meaning the five were changed from the original decision that was taken, and 12 upheld and agreed with what our staff determined to be the right eligibility for the customer. And to share a little bit of a dollar value with you, 
$1,884 of appeals in 2017, which represents only 0.27% of our total appeals budget. And in comparison to 2018, we're up a little bit to, we're hovering around 2%. And the total cost this year so far is $1,314.90. I also want to add something. When we say the average wait time for appeals to be booked is seven days, that is the average. However, certain individuals may experience a longer wait time for their appeal. That is because they could, could be waiting um, up to 30 days, and that is due to our scheduling. So when we have to book um, uh, three individuals, uh, to meet, it is expensive, so they try to have one or two days out of the month to be efficient with our tax money, and uh, we try to schedule everyone in those one or two days. Now, if that doesn't work, of course, we, we grant that as an accommodation and we'll try and make um, it work with the schedule. Also, it's very important to note that while someone is waiting for their appeal, so if we say, sorry, it's gonna be at the end of this month, they do have access to temporary wheel-trans services. So if we are, if you're going forward with an appeal, you can access wheel-trans during the time that you're waiting, which is important to note. Um, that is our presentation and we look forward to our discussion. And just to add one more point, that temporary access to wheel-trans gives you unlimited access to wheel-trans. So you have door-to-door -door service while you wait for your decision to be taken. So you're not a deemed conditional or you're not expected to take or conventional transit. Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, that was very, very helpful, uh, certainly for myself. Uh, are there, are there members, actually, uh, no, there are no deputants. Um, are there members with questions? Uh, Stephanie, then Wendy, Monica, Michael, okay. Go ahead, Stephanie. Thanks for your presentation. I have a question about the people who were turned down prior to January 2017. Um, has it been communicated to them that they could reapply and it, because they may now qualify under the new terms? And how has that been communicated to them? A absolutely. So when back uh, in around between January to March of 2017, we did, once the new eligibility switched, we went out and met with individually with all the rehab hospitals and mental health communities and um, occupational therapist societies, Alzheimer's societies, so different groups that wouldn't necessarily have been eligible before, um, CNIB, uh, different uh, visual impairments. We also um, advertise it on our website. It's very clear um, the eligibility changes and also all of these changes happened in Ontario at the same time. So it there were a lot of national headlines about it as well. So. Okay. Sorry, it, that's great. Um, but I'm wondering the actual individuals who probably believed that they could not reapply because they were where they were told that it was a permanent decision. Was there any reach, outreach to those specific people? No. There, and why not? Due to the volume, so we get over 1,000 applications per month. We have 43,000 active customers. For us to go back and connect with every customer would require an additional staff person to do that. Um, and there's just, it's just not possible due to the extremely high demand and large volumes for Wheeltrans. Okay. Stephanie, thank you. Uh, Wendy, two question. Jeez. <laughs> I said only two questions. Um, so I noticed, could you go back in your slides a little bit to the numbers of people that are now temporary, conditional, and unconditional? Yeah. There you go. So there are a lot of people here that are within the conditional and temporary categories. I noticed that in your presentation, you don't have the numbers of people who had previously been unconditional that are now considered to be conditional or temporary. Sorry, previously? People who, were, people who had flat out access to male trans. Oh yeah, we, now, so we haven't done Do you want me to clarify the question again? Oh no, no, completely understand your question. It's okay. a great one. Um, just so we're clear, we haven't reassessed those people that have found to be un uh, condition, sorry, unconditional prior to January 1st. So we haven't had the time to reassess or recertify the customers that came before January 1st. This is only as of January 1st, 2017. Okay, great. So to clarify, these are only people that have applied this year? Between January uh, 1st, 2017, 2017 to date. And, okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Actually, that's quite
quite good. Uh, I wanted to ask about the ongoing eligibility criteria for people who are in the conditional and temporary categories. So if they're considered to have conditional or temporary eligibility, at what point are they asked to re, when are they reassessed in terms of their eligibility for the system? How does it work? So it, it's for, for conditional, for example, we assess you, we make a decision that you might be conditional and your conditions might be that you need wheel-trans during the winter months. And if you wanted us to reassess that decision, you would have to go through a functional assessment and pretty much appeal the, the decision that was made. For temporary, it's a little bit different because up front we tell you you've been approved for temporary service between uh, this date till this date. And we mail you a letter as well as a follow-up. So you know if you need additional time between the time that is given to you, you would reach out to us and let us know that you still require the service where then we could reassess to see how, how much longer you require for. I have time. One, one more quick question. In terms of that panel that you have for the appeals, the appeals panel, how do you determine who the person with the, the community member with a disability is? Like, how does that work? I can speak to that. So we hosted a recruitment. We publicly advertised uh, through ACAT, through our TTC website and through all of our community agencies. We required customer or applicants to submit a letter of intent, or if they were unable, they could call and have that discussion verbally with us. Uh, we then, we worked with TTC's Human Rights and Diversity Division, as well as an HR rep, and we went through an interview process where we objectively scored people based on their um, experiences or ability to think objectively and, and be unbiased in the situation. Like we gave situational um, examples and had them uh, give their thoughts, which was a very thorough and well-documented process. And we then selected six members which sit on a pool and we uh, gave them training and um, they rotate through different appeals. And these are just people who come from all different walks of life and have all different types of disabilities. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, next two question is uh, Monica. And of course, it's more than two questions. <laughs> <laughs> right, Wendy? Oh, well, we'll see. Um, first of all, um, can you clarify? You mentioned that um, the way it's written here that after January um, 1st, 2017, the AODA required that we have conditional, unconditional, and temporary. So that's not your, okay. That's interesting. Um, one question I do have is given the conditional nature and the quote, bad days, given the way that Wheeltrans works now, and I do use it, um, you cannot book online outside of four hours and you cannot get through on the phone inside of 30 to, to 60 minutes. So if you wake up and you have a bad day, how are you changing that or what is the solutions for a conditional person to request a ride? So are you speaking to canceling a ride or booking No, one? to getting one. Okay. Because conditional says Dangerous that if you're having a bad day, right. you can get a ride. Right. Well, if I wake up and I'm having a bad day and I can't get to work on conventional TTC, it could take, it can't ask for a ride until up to four hours from the web page, and I can't get through on the phone. So what are you guys doing to improve that? So two things. We're actually improving our online services and the, uh, giving customers more accessibility when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. We've uh, put a lot of investment and time into improving the service so that it's more user friendly and you're able to book rides closer to, the, to your trip time. As well, we're going through a telephony system upgrade which would allow for more customers to get in and connect with an agent a lot faster and that's actually slated to come in July. With that upgrade, we're hoping to free up more lines because we'll be offering the callback feature, which is which is uh, gives customers the ability to press a number and then enter their contact number for one of our guys to call you back mm -hmm. as soon as the first one becomes available. In addition to that, we have an, a dedicated line for family or services, which means if you dial that number, do you sorry, do you have that now, or is that coming into effect in July? No, no, no we do. We we have the family or services line. Okay currently being operated, and it's a dedicated line for any customer who's, who's traveling by FOS to be able to contact one of our guys, 
and get through right away because we're not experiencing uh, any wait times with that particular line. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Um, okay, now um, I noticed in the actual eligibility appeals process online, um, it says that the three-person panel consists of a medical professional. Has that been switched to occupational therapist only or how does that work? Yeah, so I can speak to that. So basically, an occupational therapist does count as a medical okay. professional for us. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the same as our application forms where we call them a, a healthcare professional. So we accept um, not only just medical doctors signing off on the form, but also physiotherapists, occupational therapists, nurses, social workers, certified or orientation and mobility specialists. Just because we know sometimes it's really difficult for customers to get in and, and see a doctor whereas they may have easier access to physiotherapists and nurses and oftentimes those frontline workers or, or healthcare professionals know a, a lot more about our customers than say the, the family doctor that they see twice a year. <laughs> so. Oh I agree I use a my use my chiropractor from mine but you say specifically that an occupational therapist there for the panel that's why I'm wondering is it still a medical professional or just an like only occupational therapist from the medical right field? Right now so we uh, we we did an RFP for that uh, position, so Medicis Health Group won that, okay. and they provide an occupational therapist for the appeals panel, and that contract goes until the end of 2019, I believe, um, at which point we may do a review and, and decide we might need to open it up to other professionals. Uh, one thing that is important to note, both in our appeals panel process and in our functional assessment process, in those contracts with the occupational therapists, they are allowed to access other specialists. So for example, if an occupational therapist is sitting on an appeals panel for someone with a, a very complex neurological disorder and they may not have that expertise, they have the capacity within their contract to bring a neurologist or a specialist to that appeal to help um, them understand more about that person. Okay. Now you also mentioned that um, the appeals process can only happen once. Um, what happens if a person's medical condition changes, as most disabilities will over the course of time? At that point, you want to? Sure, I'll take that one. So at that point, we would ask you to reapply, restart the application process. You would enter a new application or submit a new application with us with that new information and we would restart the process from, uh, from, from scratch. So you okay. would be reconsidered altogether with the additional information that you provided being considered as well. And during that time you'd maintain your, your access to Wheeltrans as it stands at that time? Yes. Okay. Yes. That won't change until a decision is made. Okay. I think that's all I have for now. <laughs> that's all you're going to get right now. Uh, Monica, thank you. Uh, Michael? I have a question about the functional assessment at Sunnybrook, though. Um, is that actually, how does that exactly work, though? Is it funded through TTC? Does the customer, have, okay, so it's funded by the TTC, so the customer doesn't have to pay. Okay, and then the other question that I have is sort of off of um, uh, what Monica was saying about the conditional eligibility criteria. You had mentioned, you know, you could use Wheeltrans during the winter months. I was just wondering, what's your definition of winter and what are your other conditional eligibility criteria? So for the winter months, we err on the side of caution. So we uh, give people service, it's October 1st, I believe, October 1st, right? Yeah, so it's October 1st that they um, have access to uh, right up until April 30th. So uh, that way just, well, as we know, we sometimes get severe weather in April now, so we wanna make sure that we cover um, those customers. And some examples of other conditions would include, uh, we have a condition called rush hour, AM, PM, and that would be for, um, mostly that accommodates a lot of our uh, customers with mental health conditions like anxiety, claustrophobia. They really can't be riding the public transit system during those crowded rush hour moments. So we um, give them the door-to-door -door services during those times. Another example is, um, uh, I think we call it darkness. Yeah. It's a darkness that we call it in our system, but it's really for people, a lot of uh, new customers, again, who came on to Wheeltrans who have uh, 
low vision, particularly in the evenings when it's dark out. So we give them um, service in the morning when it's dark, the morning hours and the evening hours. Again, erring on the side of caution um, to make sure that they have access when their disability condition is present. Just to clarify, when you say rush hour, do you have a specific time, like 7 to 10 in the morning, and then 4 to 7 in the evening? Is that correct? Exactly. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, Michael, thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Yen? Uh, this is uh, slightly different from the appeals process, but um, I, I, I wonder, like, for blind people using screen reading software, I just could not do the PDF format. <laughs> And there wasn't any other choice. And of course, calling in just means waiting on the phone for hours. So uh, have you um, provided any alternative ways for blind people who may not be very good doing the form in PDF format? Go ahead, go ahead. We do have uh, both our application form and appeal form online now in a Word format. Uh, so it has two different word formats and an appeal, uh, a PDF format. And we uh, consulted an IT accessibility expert in creating that process. That was just changed, I want to say, about 60 days ago. So <laughs> if you go back on today, you'll, you'll hopefully be able to access that. And we always offer the customer the option to have the application mailed out to them. So that's always there as well. Okay. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, there's a second round of questions, and are these questions, or do you have suggestions? Because there is a way to speak to them. You have questions? Okay, anyone with questions, you can save your remarks for the, uh, the motion and speaking portion. Questions? Okay, so let's go back to Wendy, then Monica, and I'm hoping that we could conclude this matter, because you've got the, the poverty reduction strategy, which I know everyone is interested in, and this is the, the time to, to, to deal with it. Okay, um, Wendy first, and then Monica. Thank you. So it's just a quick question. I'm trying to understand the appeals process. I think all of us are, um, if we haven't been through it. And I think some of us have been through it. Yeah. Um, when you're appealing, are you, can you appeal the category that you've been placed in, as well as whether you have access to Wheeltrans? Do you have any stats on people who have shifted categories? So uh, no. We, I, so, so far, I, I don't believe anyone has shifted categories, but yes, you can appeal. The, you, you mean, can you appeal going from conditional to unconditional? Mm -hmm. Yes, you could definitely do that. You could also appeal that uh, a particular condition was missed. So, for example, if you received rush hour, like Ashton mentioned before, but you also thought you should have received winter um, exception, we could take a look at that as a part of the appeal process. Do you have any statistics on any of that? Because from what I see, your appeal data here, right, is mainly about people who have been appealed uh, and are no longer eligible for the system. But one of the things that I would find interesting is to understand people who have been shifted into categories that they think are not appropriate. So is that something that you track? We have yes, we we do track that. Out of the five appeals that were overturned, so the decision was changed. It, they only went from ineligible to eligible. There was no condition switching for out of those five. Um, but I do think probably this year or maybe next year as our appeals start to, as we get more customers applying, um, the appeal numbers are very low right now, but th they could increase. And that is something we would absolutely track just to make sure we're making the right decision. Thank you very much. Can we hear from Monica? I forgot a question. Um, so the in in person um, tribunal for the appeals. Um, sometimes it's extremely difficult for people to get to an in person meeting. Is there any possibility of of conducting them over Zoom or Skype or something similar, or is that outside of the regulations? That is currently not an option that we offer. However, we offer all of our customers a door to door trip to and from the functional assessment. So if there's, for any reason, you're unable to make it on your own, Wheeltrans will provide you service to get there and then to go back to wherever your day. Okay, so if you don't currently qualify for door-to-door -door service, but you're going into the appeal, you will provide door-to-door -door service? 100%. One of our guys will call you out and ask you if, you're, if you have um, your own plans of getting to the functional assessment or if you would like for us to, then, 
to to yes. sorry to the appeal, mm -hmm. or if you would like for us to schedule that trip for you from your house or from your pickup location to the appeal location. Okay. Back and forth. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Monica. Anyone else? No. Okay. So let's move into the speaking portion. I don't know if anyone has a motion on this matter. No. So I, we do have a motion on this matter. I believe that motion belongs to Monica. Yeah, I was going to have to withdraw it. Okay. Okay. So why don't I let you folks sort that out? Anyone else who's interested in speaking? We're, we're going to be folks. Okay. Yeah, please, Wendy, go ahead. Just, I, I just want to make a quick comment. I've said this before when we've been talking about qual qualifying for Wheeltrans, and I just want to be really frank about what my concerns are. And, you know, it's great to have categories and to be able to understand that people fit into different categories. My concern, frankly, and I'm, I'm as I said, very frank about it, is that we are going to see a, um, people who had unconditional access to the TTC um, become a much smaller group, and people are going to be moved into categories that have temporary access, and then they're going to disappear. So I'm really concerned that this is going to be a mechanism for taking people out of the system. Um, and I and it's happened before, frankly. I think I, I worked, I mentioned this before, I worked at ARCH many years ago when there was a re-evaluation of everybody who had access to Wheeltrans, and I think that's what happened for people. So um, as a person with a disability, I'm just putting that out there, that that is my concern. Um, and also just, you know, to reemphasize that people with disabilities need to be treated with dignity throughout this process. Function a functional as assessment where you have to go and prove that you have a disability is a little bit of a humiliating uh, perspective. So just to add that. Uh, Wendy, thank you. I'm sorry we were talking while you were speaking, but I'm sure the, the comments were really good. So I'm just joking. Um, that's good. I, I apologize. I was trying to split my eardrums into two. Um, Terry Lynn, you have uh, comments? Um, I wanted to speak to that. Yeah. Sure. Why don't you proceed over there? She just got, she has a, a, a particular visual aid that she's going to put on the overhead. We just want to alert um, Andy to the fact that we're going to need his assistance soon. Uh, Monica, I know you have a motion. You're ready to move? Okay, so everyone get into position. Whoever gets to their chair first, I'm going to acknowledge you. That's the way we roll in this committee. Okay, okay so Monica, you, you're, you're ready. Um, so, okay. Monica, you want to go first, please? Well, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. I'm, I'm short. All right, so we would like to make the motion, or I would like to make the motion, sorry, I'm talking as the subcommittee, <laughs> um, that the executive committee recommend that the city council request the TTC board to review the appeal process for Wheeltrans appeals for accessibility improvements, including provisions to allow applicants to attend the in-person interview via Skype, Zoom, or other technological methods. Okay. That's very straightforward. Thank you. Did you have any other comments? Or? Okay. Thank you. Um, so the motion is before you. And also, Terry Lynn, go ahead, please. And Terry Lynn is speaking to the matter. No, that's fine. Uh, just facing up as you are looking at it. Perfect. Okay. I apologize for the print. This is really small print. Um, but I did go through um, the appeals process. Initially, when I applied, I was um, granted two conditions. So Wheeltrans said that I could um, go during rush hour, a.m. and p.m., and in inclement weather. Here are some concerns that I have about that and the conditional eligibility in particular. Wheeltrans is already full. They already have a lot of customers that um, apply um, for regular trips during rush hour to go to things like work and school and daycare and stuff like that. So as you're applying for Wheeltrans and you're eligible for this AM, PM rush hour, the issues that I'm experiencing during rush hour on regular transit are the issues that I'm experiencing on rush hour for Wheeltrans because I can't get a ride. 
Um, the other thing is, it's not on here, but the inclement weather um, condition that I, what, that I did receive before I appealed um, is just simply like, I, there's no time to book a ride then. If it's inclement weather on the Monday and you want me to apply for a ride on Monday, then I can't actually get a ride. So it, that, these continue to be um, concerns. Um, when you say the family of services system is open and there's no wait times for the family of services, the family of services line is exactly the same as calling TTC customer service and saying, you know, are the elevators operating today? Is this route accessible? That kind of thing. It's not a separate service. Um, so I, I don't appreciate how Wheeltrans has characterized that. Um, the other things um, that are on here is that um, there's conditions like traveling alone. Uh, there is the darkness condition that's been described. So all of the, the things that are on this form, the things that are um, yellow in this, the small print yellow are the things that they're saying I can now access. Um, winter service does not start in October. It starts on November 1st, according to the form. It's at the bottom here. Um, till April 1st. Sorry, I have to shove that up. Um, and then things like um, um, winter service, like I know that there's lots of winter times that have happened outside of November 1st and April 1st. Um, so these are some things that uh, are very concerning to me. I'm very concerned that um, TTC Wheeltrans and the Ministry of Health, right, because you're using Sunnybrook space, um, would have someone in for a functional assessment by an OT who asked me to walk from one place in a room to another place in a room, hands-free, and I said I couldn't do it, and then she said, are you sure? And then I'm like, I can't do it, right? Um, and when I appealed, I did not just appeal with, um, at, like my family doctor's note, I'm appealing also with a specialist note. So I really want to know why those pieces of medical documentation are rendered to be not valid or rendered to be um, as something that an OT can reasonably refute. Um, these are very problematic things. I've also tried to book through Wheeltrans through this status. I've tried to book medical appointments that have not been granted. Um, and I can't rem remember the lady's name, but the comment about if you only see your GP twice a year is a very, very ableist comment. I do not see my general practitioner twice a year. I see my general practitioner 12 times a year plus specialist appointments. So that doesn't reflect the um, um, reality of people's lives that are living with disabilities, or at least some people with disabilities. Um, the other thing is that I didn't see an appeals panel. Um, maybe an appeals panel said, like maybe an appeals panel saw my application, but I didn't meet with an appeals panel. Um, and um, the other thing is, I'm fairly certain this is against FIFA, but when I asked the OT for the like documentation of what she was writing, she said she couldn't share it with me. And there's very clear privacy legislation that says it should be shared with me specifically if it's medical documentation. Um, so if I can speak to, is that okay? Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna, <laughs> when we talked about it on the transportation subcommittee, um, one of the, oh, the other thing, I have to go back. Um, the OT that assessed me said that Wheeltrans would never set up a family of services trip where a ramp didn't come down or an elevator didn't work. And I fully don't believe that that it happens all the time that ramps fail to come down on accessible bus routes. It happens all the time that um, there's some aspect of the TTC on accessible routes, like known accessible routes that doesn't work. So I just, I don't perceive that as um, factual. So now I'm going to just um, summarize what we talked about on the subcommittee. Our recommendation was that the conditional status, because it can't actually be implemented in real life, be scrapped, um, and that unconditional and, um, sorry, unconditional and temporary remain the same. That's all I have to say about it.
Okay. Thank you very much, Terry Lynn. Thank you. Um, anyone else to speak? Okay. Councillor Davis to speak. I'm just wondering if I can have a question of the mover. Uh, Terry Lynn did not move the motion. Monica moved the motion, but um, just because we're at our last meeting, so okay, why don't we? So you want to do that? You, you could do it very quickly because we do have another item that's. We have two more so items that are substantial. I, but the motion here is not the motion I heard, which is she didn't have a motion. There was the there was the Do contemplation you want to move of a, a motion mo that says you request that the status of unconditional. So we created a motion. However, today we heard. Today we heard that it's against the AODA Act to, for our motion to exist, right? because they're saying that, that those categories are coming from the AODA. If I can just interrupt because we haven't seen the motion. Monica, do you want to just uh, put that motion on the screen, even though it's not been tabled? And since we're going to go there, we might as well just see the language and everyone can be speaking from the same place of knowledge. Do we have, did you, do you have a comment? Well, we ask council to ask the provincial government. That's yeah. So just for everyone, to bring everyone back onto the same page, um, this was the motion that was coming from the Transportation Working Group Committee. Uh, we had put together this motion based on the, the recommendations that came out of the committee. Uh, we have been advised that this motion may not be in order because it may contravene the AODA. Um, so maybe what I can do is redirect the question to Deirdre to provide some explanation. I can just uh, say what uh, section 63 in the AODA Integrated Accessibility Standards Regulation does state for specialized transportation service providers, categories of eligibility, every specialized transportation service provider shall have three categories of eligibility to qualify for specialized transportation services and Wheel-trans would be considered a specialized transportation service. A, unconditional eligibility, B, temporary eligibility, and C, conditional eligibility. And I won't read the rest, but it is, that, that's what we're talking about. So then to clarify, if there was a request to change, um, so the AODA stipulates this is how they want uh, specialized transportation to lay out those criteria. If we wanted to make any changes, then the changes would have to go to the province to amend the AODA. Is that correct? Right. And, and the integrated accessibility standards regulations are updated. Um, there are committees that develop the standards, so that over time may change. I don't know what the process would be to have it changed immediately. Okay, so we, I see a lot of hands going up all of a sudden, and I see Michael first, but before Michael, I acknowledge you, I think Councillor Davis has a follow-up question. Has the TTC debated this question of the qualifications and taken any position on it? I think you're going to get an answer from the TTC, perhaps. Has the TTC debated this question of uh, the conditional eligibility and taken any position on it with the provincial government. Uh, Eva, go ahead. So through the chair, thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, we uh, thoroughly consulted through our board, um, through a variety of stakeholders regarding this. Um, I sat on the AODA committee uh, for transportation uh, in the review process, and we also had members at the originating committee for setting up the AODA AODA standards for transportation. We liaise uh, thoroughly with our partner agencies across the GTHA as well across Ontario regarding the three categories of eligibility. The intent is to ensure that we have mechanisms within our own systems, booking systems and scheduling systems to allow customers the freedom and flexibility to use the system at their choice. It is, is not a segmentation device for us to limit use to the service. It is to free up the opportunity to those customers who say they would like to use both. So while that may not meet every single customer, we do also have feedback from customers that both 
work for them. So that was not my question. Uh, my question was, has the TTC taken a position on this? It, I the, think it's just a yes or no. The, so yes, our position was that the three categories are in alignment with the AODA and that we are, we are in alignment. Our guidance was to be in alignment with that. But you didn't assess it. I, I'm, I guess I'm not sure if, I understand the choice, question, Council. If choice is the objective, it sounds to me like what it does is limit choice. Can I, um, you know, I hate to go into this more, but yeah. I, I, Terry Lynn's lived experience mm -hmm. has made it really clear how this process works, and it seems to me she's got limited choice now. Mm -hmm. So, does there have you assessed? Let's just ask satisfaction with the conditional eligibility or. So um, I, I should mention then that the conditional category is not active presently because all customers are eligible for door-to-door -door service because the system is not yet 100% accessible. And it acknowledges it. that there are subway stations that are not 100% accessible. There are streetcars that are not 100% accessible. Therefore, we are not enforcing conditions. Okay, when will that be? That will not happen until 2025 when the system is committed to being fully accessible. So in 2025, the conditional status will go into place. But up until then, it's not being implemented. What I can say is that right now the conditional status is not mandatory, unlike other properties where it is. So people still can say, well, I don't want a conditional status, I want full. They can say, I, I want a door-to-door -door trip for this journey. Is that communicated to people? In, in, in how they book, yes. So if they get their sheet like Terry Lynn had with the conditions highlighted like that, they're also told, well, it's not actually being implemented so they can have full door-to-door -door now? So if, if it is a question of status, that if the customer says that they cannot use the conventional system and that their status of eligibility should change to unconditional, that is the appeal that needs to be made because the rendering of the eligibility decision to conditional means that they indicated that there are times that they can take the conventional system. No, what I'm trying to understand. Sorry, in, Councillor, yes. I know that okay. uh, this could go on for a while and I am looking at Very your Very confusing. You're sitting at almost eight minutes. Um, and I also recognize that we have two other items. If I wasn't your, uh, your chair, I'd say go ahead, have a conversation. We need to be able to wrap this up. I think there are some things that the committee members are looking for that we will not be able to resolve today. Um, but I think that what I'd like to do is just make sure that the motion that, uh, that Monica's moved is carried forward and uh, perhaps get a commitment from the TTC to come back in the first term of the first, for perhaps the first quarter of 2019. Um, and we need to sort out how are we going to make the changes that we're looking for. It may have to go through the provincial uh, process and we also need to see if we can get the CTC to accelerate accessibility throughout the system. And I know this is a longer question, a bigger conversation. I also know that TCAT has uh, ongoing discussions with, um, with TTC, so this is not the first time they're dealing with it. Um, I see hands going up, and this is Monica as well as Michael. Uh, is, is it okay if we just try to wrap this up? Because we're not going to be able to tie it up in a neat and tidy process right now. Yeah, okay, so. I think I, the easy thing, though, is to operationalize the criteria. So during the presentation, it said basically October 1st to April 30th. However, on the handout that Terry Lynn brought up, it said November 1st to April 1st. Mm -hmm. So there's, a, there, there's confusion there. That needs to be clarified. So maybe that could be the motion, though, uh, that could be pr pr brought forward, is to sort of clarify, you know, what are the actual winter months. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. I don't know if you need a motion. I think the, the TTC staff are taking notes, so I think they're going to go back and, and as, a, as, a, as a reflection of this process, uh, just, uh, just take everything into consideration. Uh, Monica, go ahead, please. Um, 
I know you just said that it shouldn't be a motion, but I wonder if it should to advise them that they need to let their conditional people know that it's not actually a condition, that they can take door-to-door -door service when they need it, because um, Terry Lynn has stated that she's tried to get rides to her doctor's appointment and she was told she was denied because she was conditional. So something's not working. So there has to be some way that we can make a motion to make them step up and make this work because if it's not really coming into place until 2025, people don't know that and they're terrified about losing their uh, mobility around the city. So I don't know if we should put a motion, change the one that I have there to reflect that or what we should be doing. Can Okay, um, so I think that is uh, just to seek clarification. I recognize that this is an important issue. If I can just uh, draw TTC back into the conversation, I think the question is the system. I mean, obviously, the state. The statement is the system is not working for everybody at, and meeting them at, at their need of where they want the service. Uh, what can you do in the immediate? Uh, near f future to ensure that all the comments and feedback that you've received today is going to be operationalized in a way that is going to make service enhancements. Mm -hmm. So th uh, through the chair, um, I, I feel that there's a very strong disconnect uh, between what our perception is of an intent and the interpretation um, of the customers that we are not getting the message across ad accurately and, and you have very clearly uh, shared that with us and I and I do appreciate that, that, that we are uh, not communicating our, our um, the realities of what is available to customers. The intent is to give more freedom and opportunity for travel. I'm hearing today um, in, in personal experience that that is not the case. So um, immediately to rectify, I think there are some members of this committee that are uh, wheel trans customers that we would be very grateful to hear from directly. Um, uh, that, that I think that, that there is a matter of uh, urgency that we need to understand how it is being received by specific customers. Certainly we consult with our ACAT every month. We have ACAT meetings. There's a wheel trans operations subcommittee that meets to discuss all of these items. We are not hearing the disconnect, so thank you for bringing that forward today. Um, also to uh, communicate to customers more effectively. Um, we do have a newsletter coming out this summer that uh, we can send a message out to every customer um, about what conditional status means and where we are in the process of the 10-year strategy. Um, and that I was, I did come to present to this committee the Will Trans 10 year strategy uh, um, two years ago when we first embarked on it before we implemented it. And so um, I would also request, um, as you've asked it, I, I would support and look forward to coming back to, to further clear up the misconceptions and what changes we've made. So um, when the TTC came two years ago, I was at that meeting unanimously this committee said don't implement conditional status until the TTC is accessible. That is what we said. Motion. Yeah. I just moved a motion. Did you? I or for sent a motion. I just sent one as well. Okay. okay. So folks, I think we're going to have another shot at this. And that means we're going to be inviting TTC back. Um, so noted, Terry Lynn, your comment. Anyone else? I think we're getting ready to wrap this up. Uh, Councillor Davis, you just so that we each know while their staff are working on it, my motion says City Council requests the TTC to uh, improve communication with wheel trans customers to clarify and confirm that conditional status, um, that conditional, conditional eligible uh, clients are. Yes. Are, that conditional clients with conditional eligibility yes. are still eligible for door-to-door -door service until such time as the TTC is fully accessible. Make sure the clerk's got that, that all clients with conditional eligibility are still eligible. Okay. Or um, even status, conditional so that, so eligibility that's the motion. status. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor. Um, I have, a, a, I guess, a, an accountability uh, motion with respect to follow-up. Um, is it ready? Sorry, I, I, I know the clerks are feeling all of us under pressure. We're just going to put it on the... Oh, sorry, Stephanie, do you want to speak first? 
Yeah, sorry, just a really quick addition to that is I think it has to include staff to be informed as well because it's clear that this is, this is being implemented by the staff of the TTC okay, great. and they need to be informed. Thank you very much. Uh, Carol's going to make that change. And well, the TTCs, whoops. So if I can just, uh, let's keep the, the cross talking to a minimum. It's, it becomes almost conversational. Yeah, okay, so. So um, I'm just gonna move a very simple motion. Uh, the TTC, that the TTC report to a TAC meeting in the first quarter of 2019 on service enhancements made based on the comments by members of TAC uh, that you heard today. So I, I think we're, we're not gonna get everything we, we need, but certainly we want, I do know that you've been taking notes. It was very obvious to me that you seemed almost alarmed that you heard this type of feedback from the committee. Uh, I don't think that the committee members are, and I think the committee members are just as alarmed perhaps that, uh, that, uh, that there's a perception that things are okay. Uh, so I think we learned something today, um, and this is probably going back to our, one of our earlier items is that it is very important to have people with lived experience populating these committees to provide this type of feedback. Um, and so hopefully we'll be able to see you folks again um, back in, in the first quarter. Anyone else, Michael? No? Okay, so we've got a few motions. I'm gonna start with Monica's motion and then Councillor Davis and myself. We can take them as a package, is that, okay? is that agreeable? Okay, so all those, all those in favor of the motions? Okay, any opposed? That carries, thank you very much. And then to TTC staff, thank you very much for your participation and your presentation today. And moving right along, we have, uh, we're now on DI 20.5, Toronto Poverty Reduction Strategy Update on 2018 Community Engagement Initiatives. This committee has been waiting a very long time to hear from this group, so this is great to have you here. Uh, presenting before us is Sean McIntyre, uh, Policy Development Officer with the Poverty Reduction Strategy, Social Policy Administration Analysis and Research, uh, Social Development Finance Administration, does all that fit on your business card? Amazingly, it does. It does, okay. Well, good for you. I don't always spit it out right <laughs> okay. when I'm saying it, though. Um, so thank you, Sean, for being here. I just want to note the order. After Sean does his presentations, we're gonna hold the questions from committee, and then we're gonna welcome our speaker, uh, Daphne, uh, Emily Daigle. Okay, go ahead, Sean, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so good morning, Chair and committee members. Thanks very much for inviting us to be here. It's a privilege and an honor. Um, as uh, the chair mentioned, my name is Sean McIntyre with a mouthful of a title. Um, essentially, I do policy work in the Poverty Reduction Office. Um, so one of the things we wanted to talk about today um, is our 2018 community engagement um, activities and initiatives uh, to, to present that to you as well as to get some feedback on that and encourage some further participation and involvement. Um, the, stat, uh, the status that we're at right now is we're, again, con doing this engagement right now because we're trying to develop um, a four-year action plan uh, under the recommendations of the Poverty Reduction Strategy to present to the new term of council. And I'll get to why we're doing that. Sorry. I had it on second. The clerk's overrun it. Sorry about that. Um, so yes, so we're in the process of developing an action plan, four years of actions that we'll recommend uh, to council for approval in the new term. Um, but obviously we want to get that right, so we're spending the better part of this year um, evaluating uh, the actions of the previous term council, um, or the action within the poverty reduction strategy in the last term of council, um, as well as starting to fine tune what we want to recommend in, uh, in the next term. Uh, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly in the interest of time. I've got a lot of slides, they're all in your handouts, but uh, we had lots of time for questions and answers afterwards. Um, so quickly, I'm going to go through a brief overview and history of the Toronto Poverty Reduction Strategy, um, our critical path for 2018 and 2019 in terms of how we're going to get to that four-year action plan and the recommendations, the current opportunities and uh, future opportunities for stakeholder and community involvement, um, as well as uh, some questions and answers at the end. So a brief overview. Um, in 2015, Toronto City Council unanim unanimously adopted uh, the Poverty Reduction Strategy. It's a 20-year strategy that contains 17 recommendations under five specific pillars and one broader theme. Those are housing stability, service access and coordination, 
transportation equity, food access, quality jobs, and livable incomes. And then the broader theme is systemic change, which is woven into all of those specific pillars. I'm going to go through each of them really briefly, just the recommendations, um, because underneath those recommendations are 71 actions that Council directed uh, city staff to take um, over the course of this last term, and that will take forever to go through, but I certainly have some examples of those if they come up in the uh, discussion period afterwards. So the housing stability recommendations, and some of these are, are quite broad, um, and a lot of actions fit underneath them. The first is to improve the quality of all affordable housing across the spectrum. The second is to assist low-income individuals and families to secure and maintain affordable housing. And the third is to increase the supply of affordable housing across the city. Under the theme of service access and coordination, which is quite broad, um, broader than housing or transportation per se, it, it, really refers to all of the other services that the city provides, um, from recreation to childcare to um, uh, IT, um, right across the, the spectrum. Um, so the specific recommendations under service access are four, so these are in order, one through 17, to increase service access and availability, and five, to put a particular lens on improving access to high quality programs for children and youth. The third pillar is transportation equity. It started out as transit equity, um, but over the course of the term realized that we needed to broaden that definition uh, substantially. So it's now transportation equity. Uh, recommendation six is to make transit more affordable for low-income residents. Um, I'll give one example here because it's, uh, it's fresh, which is the launch of the low-income transit pass. We're in the first phase of that. It was launched um, April fourth of this year for uh, recipients of Ontario Works and Ontario Disability Support uh, Programs. And that's going to expand and we can talk about that a little bit later if others are interested. And recommendation seven is specifically to improve transit services in the inner suburbs. The fourth pillar is food access and uh, our eighth recommendation, of course, very aspirational but uh, important, is to eliminate hunger in all of its forms. Uh, recommendation nine is specifically to increase access to affordable, nutritious, and culturally appropriate food across the city. Our fifth pillar is quality jobs and livable incomes, and the recommendations uh, under this pillar are ten to improve the quality of and access to income supports, eleven to create employment opportunities for low-income groups with high unemployment rates, and 12, to improve the quality of jobs that exist or are being created in this city. Our sixth broader theme, which is systemic change, um, has a series of recommendations. The first is to leverage the economic power of the city um, as an organization to stimulate job growth, support local businesses, and drive inclusive economic growth. Next is to create a seamless social support system then to coordinate and evaluate the implementation of the Toronto Poverty Reduction Strategy, so that's the evaluation phase that we're in at the moment. Sixteen is to engage city staff and residents on poverty reduction efforts. And lastly, to dedicate funding to poverty reduction actions. So that's the strategy in its broadest sense. Um, in terms of what we're doing now, here's our 2018 to 2019 critical path. Um, the way the, the strategy was developed uh, or proposed was it would be broken, it's a 20 year plan broken up into five chunks of four year terms to coincide with the council terms. Uh, so every four years, this is the first time we're doing it because the strategy was developed in the last term of council, or the current term of council. Our office updates its plans to refine the actions that we'll recommend to Council for the City to take to achieve the recommendations and the strategy that we just went through. Uh, the next four-year action plan for the next term will be submitted to the new City Council for approval in early 2019. At this point we're targeting April, um, but it'll depend on what their uh, uh, agenda cycle looks like. Um, 
and in order to get ready for that, as I mentioned, a number of community engagement activities are underway or planned to help us submit the best course of action to City Council. Uh, just a, a bit of a breakdown in terms of where, where we're at with some dates attached to it, and I'll go through these in turn. Um, but in March and April of this year, we hosted, uh, in conjunction with the Poverty Reduction Advocate, Councillor Joe Mahevic, the hashtag Tackle Poverty TO Speaker Series here at City Hall, where we had, uh, well, I'll go through that in a second, but they were uh, five events focused on each of the five themes. Uh, we're just launching now, and I'm going to go into this in more detail, a series of community conversations, which is where we hope to expand our engagement and consultation right across the city in a variety of formats. In the early fall, um, we're taking all of this feedback that we're receiving up until then and continuing after that, and we're going to do some serious deep engagement with city divisions, agencies, boards, and commissions. This is, of course, while the election is on, so we've got some time to do some serious staff work here in the building um, to work really, um, uh, to drill down really specifically within each division or across multiple divisions in terms of what their big moves are, how they align with the poverty reduction strategy, um, and what actions they might like us to recommend and assist them with. And that conversation is gonna go two ways. And we'll be clustering different divisions so that they're learning from each other and sharing best practices and ideas. After that process is done, we'll start to analyze everything we've heard from the community, from stakeholders, from staff, um, from processes such as this and any other engagement that happens and start to propose some actions that we'll ultimately be recommending. Um, we're gonna figure out a way to test these in the early part of the year before we have a formal um, recommendation to council. So we'll be coming back to groups that we've met with um, to give some broad strokes in terms of the direction we're hoping to go in. We'll be meeting with the, the new councillors who've been elected. Um, and uh, perhaps some other unique ways that we can get, um, get our thinking out into the public before a report is finalized. And then of course in the spring we will be submitting that report to council for approval. Actually, I'm just gonna add on that. Um, at the end of each year, we submit a report to council um, with uh, a report on the actions that were taken the previous year and the outcomes of that, the actions that we're recommending for the subsequent year, as well as we provide a report to community which consolidates all that information. Um, as there, and we normally do that at the November or December council meeting, as council won't be sitting, um, we're in the process of trying to figure out how we can achieve that step either without going through council at that point or tying it into our full four-year term report that will happen in the spring. Um, so we're still batting around some ideas. So very briefly, um, I'll just go back to the speaker series. So again, th these were hosted by uh, Councillor Mahevic and our office in uh, the last two months. Uh, all here at City Hall, residents were invited to attend panel discussions with subject matter experts, community stakeholders, and uh, specifically a member of the Lived Experience Advisory Group, which advises us. Um, to discuss each of the five core themes of the PRS that we just went through. The structure of that, we had questions that we developed that were posed to the panelists to spark some specific discussion on where we should be focusing our attention in the next phase of the poverty reduction strategy. Following the panel discussion, residents who attended were then participated in smaller group discussions to further explore those topics and directly provide their input to city staff. Each of the sessions had approximately 50 to 75 residents um, that attended with hundreds more observing or participating through social media channels. Just on that also, the raw notes from those sessions are, um, they're posted on our website. I'll get to our website in a second. Um, but the feedback there has helped us fine tune the questions that we're now posing in the community conversation guides, which are about to be launched. Um, they may be on the website now. Our staff are working on uploading it. They weren't there this morning when I came down, but it's hopefully going to be up today. 
anyhow, I'll describe what they are in a little bit. Um, so the community conversation guides are designed to, to provide more opportunities for community input into the strategy. Um, we're distributing them uh, through a variety of forms to any individual group or organization to organize their own consultations. So we'll have a worksheet with those questions um, that people can work through in whichever way they want, focus on whichever topic they want from whichever angle is of most importance to them. Um, the guides are designed to allow participants participants to provide input on any one, several, or all five of the themes, as well as opportunities to comment on any other thoughts or recommendations that aren't captured in the worksheets. And finally, they are, again, hopefully available now, if not in very short order, in an accessible format on our website at toronto.ca slash poverty reduction. On the website, we're also uh, posting an online survey with those same questions so that any individual who isn't participating in a workshop can uh, complete those worksheets and get their feedback to us directly. Additionally, any group um, requiring assistance in or requesting assistance in facilitating an event can receive support from us. Um, we have our uh, lived experience advisor group members trained to act as uh, facilitators and will be available upon request. City staff uh, can be requested to attend um, any conversation that is set up. Um, additionally, we'll work with organizations uh, to make available any support, such as tokens, AL ASL interpretation, uh, language interpretation, attendant care. Um, and those requests can come directly to us. Um, and just before I'll con conclude, and we'll get into this in the discussion, um, and related to an earlier comment about outreach specifically to the disability and accessibility community. Um, we certainly recognize that it hasn't been as deep or as fulsome as it can be. Um, it's one of the reasons that we're here today. Um, I'll also note that on our lived experience group, um, again, a, an official city body that advises us, we do have a number of members who identify as living with disabilities. Um, but I would like to make a specific proposal in addition to um, uh, if, if any of you or your um, uh, contacts wanted to download the community conversation guide and host their own uh, meeting and, and put an accessibility lens on any or all of those themes, that would be most welcome. Um, but I would also like to invite members here, um, anyone who's interested to perhaps uh, have a, a brief chat a meeting in our office um, to go through our engagement strategy and make sure that we've got it right. Um, we can certainly have that discussion here as well, um, but that opportunity is, uh, is certainly available, notwithstanding the fact that this is the last meeting of this committee. Um, so with that, I will conclude and thank you. Our contact information is uh, there on the last page of the slide. So thank you. That was a mouthful, but uh, happy to dig into it. Right. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Councillor Wong-Tam had to step out. I'm Rahima Mullah. I will be chairing. And uh, our next speaker is Emily Diego. Oh. Emily? Yeah. You have, yeah. Whenever you're ready, you have five minutes. There we go. I just want to make sure it was on. So I'm going to speak to this in two, uh, three quick points. Number one, it's great the poverty reduction strategy was done, but I feel like a lot of the disabled community was left out in the cold. And the reason why I say that is because places like March of Dimes, places like Variety Village, places like Balance for Blind Adults, um, and the CNIB hub, and the different organizations that we access on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis were not included in this. I, as a, as a multiply disabled woman, um, thank God I'm very involved with City Hall. I, so I knew more about it and I've deputated on it a few times to different committees. But the thing is, is that major groups in the disability communities were left out completely. And those of us that have been able to get into affordable housing, and I do air quotes with my fingers, 
Well, it's not very affordable when your rent is 651, your max on ODSP is 769, and your rent goes up every year. And people with disabilities, especially physical, visual, and auditory, as well as learning, all in, rolled into one woman in a rolling wheelchair, um, have to wait for housing for between anywhere between five and 35 to 40 years, if you look at some of the wait lists at Housing Connections. So that supposed affordable housing, um, such as the Pan Am Athletes Village with the March of Dimes program for 30 of us, becomes inaffordable. It becomes living in fear, like I am now, because we only have guaranteed subsidy until 2024, and then we don't know what's going to happen. Not only that, with the rent that keeps going up uh, at one point, well, this year it was 1.2%, every year, that's $13 a year right now. Well, it was this year. That's going to mean that eventually it's going to be over our maximum on ODSP, and we're not going to be able to have a place to live. And in my case, in my area, you've got about 70 people with disabilities that live on ODSP, either singles or couple, and some people have had to, a couple have had to be split up and put into two one-bedroom places because of the size of the apartments or the size of their wheelchairs or their needs. And it become, my husband and I should be in a two-bedroom because of all our equipment, but due to the fact that the rent was too high, even on affordable, we are in a very tiny, cramped 300 square foot space. Um, not the best design, but it's a place to live. We wrote in the back end of Scarborough with no accessibility, no PSWs. So it was an option for us to move where we are, but it was our only option because it was accessible. But if I'd known then what I know now and the the fear we live in that we're going to lose our subsidy in 2024. And I know some people, will, some people will say, oh, that's five and a half years away. What are you talking about? Yeah, but those people don't understand that getting a place to live through housing connections is darn near impossible in five and a half years. Um, and there's no basic standard. There's no standard of accessibility in those places that are deemed wheelchair accessible on housing connections. There's no set standards. I've lived in three different places of it. One, it was the, it, it was barely accessible, no grab bars in the bathroom, it was a tub. The stove was not accessible, it was a regular stove with the buttons on the front. And the only thing different was the counters were had nothing under the front counters, but you still couldn't reach the upper counters. The apartment door wasn't didn't have a button and there was a lot of inaccessibility. And poverty reduction strategy doesn't just mean housing. It means things like the welcome home booklet and homelessness. How many of us in this room have had the fear of being homeless? How many of us have had to beg and plead to keep our apartments? How many of us go eat day by day not knowing where our next meal is going to come from and if that soup kitchen is wheelchair accessible? One, three of the main wheelchair accessible soup kitchens closed during the summer. Emily, can you? Uh, yes, ma'am. Closing remarks. Thank but you. the other problem is, is our own welcome home policy book is not available in large print. It's not available in braille. It's not available in audio book. It's a printed book, and in it, the places are not deemed. There is no designation or explanation of what accessibility there is or is not. So that's a major barrier to accessibility. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is there any questions? Monica and Terry Lynn. Sorry, is this for um, the deputy or for the speaker? Oh, no, I don't have any. Your story is great, it, it Claire. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you, Emily. Okay, questions for staff? Monica? Okay, first of all, um, do we have a stat as to how many um, persons with disabilities are in poverty? I don't have that in front of me at the moment. Um, I know it's significant. Yeah, so they should be a significant part of this entire process. It is extremely frustrating that they have not been, and for shame um, on all of you for that. Um, another question I have, has anybody ever considered just making all ex um, 
uh, affordable housing, accessible, period, not a certain percentage or anything else because you never know what you're going to run into. Uh, I think that's something that should be uh, referenced over the next little while as we're putting together our action plan, how to uh, push that agenda forward. We welcome that. Just Ian, go ahead. I know that the uh, advisory panel, uh, however they're described, has been set. But um, understanding, I I don't know if there a significant representation from the disability community and also diverse disability representation on all of those five or six groups that you have, and I wonder if, it, if it's possible to add um, or make sure that there is a clear representation from the disability on each one of those um, panels or advisory committees. That's, that's a start. I, I do appreciate that um, this phase that you just mentioned, that we can all form our little groups and work on, use the worksheets and all that, but I, again, it seems that the onus now is on us <laughs> to, 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 you know, and I think that for the disability community, uh, it, it can be onerous. Um, so I just wonder how else um, the, the, the poverty reduction group can maybe do a bit of catch up and, um, uh, you know, do, do more, not just outreach, but do more to make sure that the disability lens is included in all five or six areas that's been presented. Okay, maybe I can answer both of those pieces. Were those questions or just comments? Yeah, okay, so first in terms of the lived experience advisory group, the, the term is uh, ending in 2019, so the recruitment phase for the second term of the Limited Experience Advisory Group um, will be will beginning within the next year, and certainly that is uh, a targeted criteria we will be looking for. Again, there is representation now, um, but we do want to have the most diverse representation on that group every year. Uh, the second piece in terms of, of outreach and including the accessibility lens, and I do want to emphasize that it's, uh, it's at the top of our mind in the office that we want to infuse within each of these themes the accessibility lens because that was while well, I wouldn't say missing it wasn't emphasized within each and there's an opportunity now to refine that um, so in terms of the engagement right now I, I hope I didn't leave the impression that the only way that people can uh, participate at this point is just through downloading a guide or doing a survey. Um, we do want to do some targeted outreach. Um, we're willing to talk to anyone, anytime, anywhere. Um, but specifically recognizing different populations within the city that are either harder to reach or we haven't done a good enough job reaching them is another um, core priority of our work this year. Um, and again, back to, to my comment earlier, I'd very much like to sit down with some of the people in this room um, and others to, to figure out how we can do some, tar not just looking at our guides and are they accessible, do they ask the right questions, but to help us do that targeted outreach. It's something we want to do and we're gonna lean on your expertise if you're willing to share it. Sorry, thank you very much. Uh, Terry Lynn. Um, hi, Sean. Yeah, I didn't get the impression that you said people with disabilities were not included, right? Like, um, do you have a sense of, um, like, the number of folks that may be on, on league that speak to disability? If you don't, that's okay. I, I do. Um, I mean, I don't want to go through each of them, but it's yeah. a, about a third of our active members right now um, identify as, uh, as having a disability. Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, because I didn't get that impression, yeah. so I just wanted to, to, to share that. Um, but also, the question that I have is, um, are your league um, members uh, are they remunerated in some way, especially if they host like a yes. community conversation? Okay, yes. great. Yes, and they are at every meeting, yeah. at every um, at the, these community conversations. If okay. they're providing their services, they are compensated for that. 
okay. according to an honorarium policy that we have at the city and, and is beefed up in our division. Okay, great. Okay, thank you very much. Terry Lynn, uh, to question Wendy, then Michael, anyone else? Because we're gonna close it up. Wendy, go ahead. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I just wanna, I do have a question as a little bit of a comment first. I want to reiterate some of the disappointment that you've heard here, unfortunately, uh, around how people with disabilities have been considered, um, both in the documents that you've produced, because I've looked at some of them, and the, the conversation that you've had, and in fact, the plan that you have for moving forward. I think that there are three at least elements there that you need to think about in terms of um, really understanding what the needs are of this community. In fact, in one of the, the background documents, there's no mention of a number for, um, the people, for people with disabilities who are living in poverty. And it says that the, that the census data is not available, but surely you could find some kind of data that substantiates the amount of poverty that this community encounters. I mean, I just did a quick look, and uh, you know, the Daily Bread Food Bank says that in their 2016 hunger report, 33% of its food bank users are people that use ODSP. So that's a pretty good proxy for how much this impacts this community. Um, so my question is, can you commit today here to convening a community conversation with people with disabilities in the city of Toronto? Yes. So, okay. And two, can you also commit to convening a meeting of people from this committee that are interested, certainly I would be interested, um, in addition to that community conversation to discuss improving this because I think we all recognize it needs some improvement. Yes, and I'd like to do that in short order and in advance of setting up any particular broader meeting. Okay. Thank you very much for your question and for the answer. Uh, Michael, please go ahead. Okay, hi, I'll just echo the points that others have made that it's very important that the disability community be consulted. I'm also going to reiterate the comment that I made earlier about public appointments, about uh, tapping into the AOCs like the 519 and Apple Grove, because I find that those agencies are oftentimes overlooked and that you will often find that lived experience there. Um, one of the other things, just to sort of uh, touch upon um, the deputant uh, Emily's talk, rents are going up through the roof and even people who have stable employment are finding it difficult to pay the rent or oftentimes what they're doing is they're subsidizing their landlord's mortgage. Um, one thing that I noticed um, that maybe wasn't talked about but could be included in the poverty reduction strategy is, is there a contingency plan in the event that interest rates grow, go up? And there is that concern that we may be on the verge of a recession, that more and more people that may be middle class and comfortable now may suddenly find themselves struggling in poverty. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else to ask questions? Okay, moving into speakers, anyone to speak? Okay, I know that Wendy is preparing a motion. No, not oh, okay. On. I see, I see, okay. Anyone would like to speak to this or have we provided all the advice we possibly can to the team here? And opportunities for lots more advice to come. Okay, okay, so thank you very much. I don't see any other speakers. Uh, I'm sorry I missed that. What seems to be a very exciting discussion. Uh, Councillor Davis, go ahead. Uh, Sean, I did just have one. Question, there, so for 2019 budget, there are no additional requests for 2019 or are we looking then to 2020 for any additional funding for the poverty reduction strategy? So the divisional uh, initial submissions are happening at this point. Right. Um, there will certainly be poverty reduction initiatives that are, uh, that are ongoing or are planned in 2019, and I expect that those will be um, submitted by the divisions that are responsible for them. So they're sort of carryovers of the 20, whatever it was, to 2018? Yeah, I'll give you, I'll give you one example. Very quickly. So, yeah, sorry, so for the Fair Pass program, yes. council approved phase one, phase two, phase three. Phase two, which is an expansion with new dollars, will be in, the staff is, will be proposed to be in the staff recommended budget because that is council direction. Okay. Great, thank you very much. Okay, so thank you. Uh, can I please have a motion to receive the report, the presentation? Thank you, Monica, all those in favor? Any opposed? That carries, thank you. And thank you, uh, Sean, for all, the, all your work. Uh, a lot more ahead of us. Okay. 
Um, we have our last item, and I just want to just alert everyone to the time. Uh, we're going to just go. Ex we're going to extend the time a little bit, uh, just to conclude this item, and that will bring us to the very end of our business. We don't need a motion, apparently. Can we eat while we're listening? <laughs> we can, but I would. Would folks prefer a break at this point in time, or you want to just plow through? How do you feel? Uh, no, no, no. But, but you do have to reconvene. I, your break is going to be no more than five minutes to get your sandwiches nope. and come back. Yeah. Yes, so there, I'm sorry, folks. Uh, there is a request for a, a break. Councillor Davis re recommended a break, and the committee members all. I didn't really recommend a break. I just thought if people could grab a sandwich, we could yeah, combine so since we went you, over. You folks want to just hang on um, for a few minutes. We're going to just take a, a, a five, ten minute recess. Everyone can grab a sandwich and, uh, and then come back to the table, use the washroom. I certainly had to go myself. So. Um, but please, um, we, we prepared lunch and I uh, hope that we would be able to say goodbye and thank you properly. So hang on tight. I know you've been very patient. And we love the fact that you're here. Okay. Thank you. That's right. Oops.
Okay, everyone, if I can have your attention again, we're going to bring the meeting back to order. We're going to start it all over. Um, let me set this up for you folks. We are now on item DI 20.6, Accessibility Features of the City of Toronto website. Uh, we have Lan Nguyen, Deputy Chief Information Officer, Information and Technology, who is here with her team, and they're going to provide a presentation on the City of Toronto's website of Accessibility Features. Uh, please proceed, and thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, the Council. Um, uh, as um, the Council was introducing, my name is Lang Nguyen, and with me, I have uh, Marco Pamelo. He's the manager of digital technology services in my section. And we have also Michael Nigo. He's a project, re recently been recruited as a project manager for our IT accessibility project. So today, I just want to uh, give you, as a pre in our presentation, a brief update on the accessibility feature of Toronto.ca, uh, the CD website, uh, and um, also uh, share with you the plan uh, in terms of how we can move the CD website and applications and all the online services, uh, public-facing online services, to be accessible and complying with the with the um, ODA target date of. 2021. So just uh, let me start with the background. Uh, the city website uh, was recently uh, launched in December 2017. It, has, uh, it was part of the web revitalization projects. And one of the key uh, feature uh, and key principle before we launch that all website um, and pages and application, existing application that provide online services to the public need to really be complied with the uh, AODA, uh, the uh, WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guide 2.0. And with that, we have done uh, a number of uh, steps and approach during the projects. Uh, we, <clears throat> we have established a digital citizen uh, advisory group and during the process of uh, redevelop the website uh, we also have very specific group with members from the disability community we have about 83 digital citizen who has been identified self-identified and participate in the consultation for the development of the new website and the new website uh, was uh, really um, also developed with very specific goal. Uh, it had to be accessible, it has to be service oriented, it has to be citizen centered, and it needs to be designed and structured to enhance the usability, the searchability, the findability, and the navigation to encourage citizen interaction and, particip and participation. That was very, very important. And it, it should really also provide um, all of the feature that be cohesive and appealing uh, in the design so that it be fully accessible. Because if it's not accessible, it won't be accepted to be actually present in the website. I thought that would be important for, um, for the committee to understand. And that's how we came to launch by December 2017 with those policy and process and procedure uh, uh, um, with, the, with the launch. Okay. Uh, so um, just wanted to share with you, what does accessibility feature mean? Uh, it has four principles, perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And with these, what it means to user like us, it has to be able, to, you have to be able to navigate it easily. You need to be able to find it very friendly, very findability, and uh, very easy to search, right? And of course, with that, uh, we need to really include and in making sure that this accessibility feature does include a new technology, assisted technology with devices, with processes, and so on and so forth. Right? And um, uh, we, it would be important for us to ensure that these principles would be adhered to by city staff to any project, any systems, or any information that need to be uh, uh, need to be presented in the website. 
So uh, with that, I, I wanted to share with you also that in, the, uh, in, to, in 2017, we have developed a partnership with OCAD with the Institute of Inclusive Design Research Center, and they help us to uh, uh, go through uh, the applications existing in the website to do an audit and to do an uh, accessibility assessment. And we've, we have established a remediation plan with that to make, ensure that they can be then launched as part of the new website. Okay. We also um, um, have put together a capital budget uh, submission last year, and we got it approved for a three years uh, project uh, of an about $4.1 million over three years to ensure that any existing application, because we have over a thousand application on the website, right, uh, will be able to really also work toward AODA compliance. And I'd like to mention too that I'm sitting on the IT share services with the other agencies and commission with the city, like TTC, library, and poli uh, police, and so on and so forth. And we have agreed that we're going to work together as a group to share resources, to share lesson learned, to share experience, and to share practices. So it will be consistent uh, between the city and agencies, right? With uh, the project, we now have uh, started with uh, Michael, so as a project manager, we have a small group, and also with staff from um, Marco, started to put together a project plan to also put together an outreach strategy that we'll be able to invite the member. We already recruited Emily uh, to participate, to continue participate in the digital citizen. And we're going to also uh, definitely, we'll come back to the committee, get further advice so that we can also outreach other organization, other association and group that I just heard actually today. And that will be one of our plan to make sure that it's all going to be inclusive, but also encourage more participation, more engaging, and testing, right? Because we need that kind of feedback. So that will be part of our, our uh, plan, OK? We um, continue to also uh, work in improving uh, the, those uh, accessibility issue that we have in some of these uh, applications that we have existing because you can imagine that we have many legacy systems and a lot of them does require very specific fix and correction and Marco team is uh, working very hard to make sure those issues related to mobile accessibility will be addressed by the third quarter of the year this year because I, I, I do notice that there was some issue that related to mobile accessibility. So that already been identified and, and recognized and, and is being fixed by your team, right? <laughs> We're working also very close with Stratcom. Uh, Francine. Oh, she has to step out. She's a manager of digital communication services. So the two group between the digital communication services and digital technology services, we work together in ensure that the communication to external uh, stakeholder and communi communication to internal staff will be cohesively. With that, we're also going to be launching um, education and training because we need to make sure that accessibility training is an ongoing practice. We already put in place in our in any IT procurement practice for new systems or new RFP, it does have an accessibility requirement. Uh, and the vendor, any vendor who wanted to do business with the city, they need to uh, indicate and demo demonstrate if their system or their solution would be uh, complying with the accessibility regulation. So that's a good news. We started to, for example, the, the park and rec RFP that we sent out to replace the recreation system uh, is already have that feature. Vendor has to really provide the accessibility feature. And that's going to be, uh, that's already in a procurement practice, as well as in any contract uh, from a legal contract with the vendor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, I, I think uh, it's very also um, important to, for me to share with you uh, the, the one of the uh, very specific initiative that Marco is launching. He's uh, in the process of launching an, an internal digital um, accessibility portal to provide tool training 
uh, and uh, a practice for city, for city staff. And with that, we also going to be planning with our stakeholder to establish a digital accessibility portal for uh, citizens and uh, public and uh, businesses. And that would be a, a, a central place that people can come in and look at what are some of the tools, some uh, technology that can actually be used, or any questions that can actually refer back to the accessibility unit in Marco team. Okay, we do have uh, in the city a accessibility workstation with a, a assisted device and software on the third floor of Metro Hall, and we plan to make sure that will be part of the orientation, training, and education, as well as continue bringing new assisted device and technology um, that can be used and tested by public as well by city staff. Right. Um, so in terms of the long-term success factor, uh, we have done quite a lot of work from the web, Toronto.ca. We continue also taking due, uh, um, making due diligence to make sure that not only the Toronto.ca website, but any specific website that provided uh, by business division, uh, uh, by public health, by uh, Toronto Employment Services, anything that we can continue working to ensure that there is a cohesive co coordination and collaboration so that public citizens are not getting um, inconsistent practice, uh, inconsistent information. So uh, we have a working group working together, and we have a web governance committee chaired by the deputy city manager, Liana Carboni, and now he's, she's acting city manager, to ensure that governance, including digital accessibility, is in place. So she's monitored that and asking for a regular report. Okay. So what I would like to invite, um, definitely your participation, your engagement, your advice, uh, how, how people can get involved. We have, like I mentioned before, the digital citizen advisor. We continue making sure that our outreach to the civic tech community, to the uh, uh, people with the disability community, and also uh, with academic and um, also businesses to ensure that uh, practice, but also the uh, uh, the value and the commitment and also the experience, sharing experience, would be part of our strategy ongoing forward. So. With that, I'd be more than happy to uh, respond to any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Len, for the presentation. Are there members with questions of staff? Uh, Wendy, go ahead. Thank you for the presentation. Um, a lot of city materials end up as PDFs. <laughs> I'm just wondering how you manage those. Yeah. So we've been uh, addressing this from the beginning of the web revitalization project because we know that has been, and uh, we have like hundreds of thousands of pages in PDF. Uh, between us and Stratcom, we did have a company to do the conversion of PDF into more accessible. It costs about $5 per page. Uh, and, $5. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry, that. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we do, uh, we went through part of that project. We went through and invite division, business division to use that. And we are now actually working toward, and I think it's already in place, to actually help division when they publish any new content with PDF, it will be accessible feature. And we continue working on addressing the legacy uh, PDF to make sure that business division would take very specific attention to direct the public uh, uh, in terms of if they cannot access PDF, they can phone in, they can email, they can also uh, look at different uh, business process to address their query. Mm -hmm. So to clarify, are you currently still using the external contractor for PDF, accessible PDF production? I, I believe the company is still um, in a contract with the city. And uh, we are already talking about the two initiatives that I, I wanted to mention to part of our plan to establish a number of roster with vendor that can help us 
to really bring in the training, uh, the services to turn this uh, accessibility issue, address the accessibility issue, so become a roster of uh, VOR roster for the city as well to be shared with agency. That's that's one of the goal. The second thing is continue bringing specific company as resources for division to use it to address the current outstanding PDF as, as part of the project plan and also address to the conversion because we're going through and cleaning a lot of old PDF. We got rid of must be tens of thousands of old PDF that totally useless, right? So that's a continued ongoing monitoring, auditing, checking, and being able to reduce the percentage of existing non-accessible PDF. And hopefully, as we go, because this is the first year, we're gonna actually continue to have a monitor and tracking and reporting back to the division through the web governance. So they are aware and making sure that the city staff also are trained because we, our group is small. What is important is really the accountability at business division and the training of staff and management so that they become uh, very much aware of the practice and where they can get support. Any other questions? Uh, what, uh, Stephanie, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, just a question about the actual language that goes on there and the way it's done. So are you, are you ensuring plain language format and clear communication, bullet forms? Yes. And, uh, yeah. And you know, we have, um, I can't remember, but we have over a thousand digital citizens coming from different segments of population with different also segments of where they're from in community. And in the past three, four years, it's actually four years now, they have been engaged in every step of the design assessment. And we have also, um, through IPSO, sent out survey. And with that, they can also, they were asked to identify in terms of which segment of the population. And there are, there was very specific group come back and actually give us feedback on accessibility. So far, the survey has been very positive in terms of meeting uh, the public expectation but on the same time giving a lot of feedback. So we're going to be continuing using the survey to independent group to ensure that uh, if there's any gap, we can immediately put action into it. So plain language, once again, sociability, and once again, also easy to find, especially around the web content, because it's all about making sure the web content are understandable, not just being able to be searchable, but understandable by the public. So that is also a huge training at the uh, city uh, in the uh, division. So we have a group of what we call a web content coordinator. They are the, uh, uh, the first uh, contact. So anything to do the web content, inconsistent, out of standard, not accessible, they're the one that we go to working. Okay. Thank you very much, Len. And uh, Councillor Davis, to question, followed by Yin. Just um, so I understand. We are essentially uh, delegating and training, training and delegating authority to the divisions to make sure that they're complying with certain citywide standards. Yeah. Are they getting the resources they require in order to uh, actually do the work that's required? Yeah. So we use a two-prong approach, right, to the micro, uh, our collaboration within IT and EDHR. We're going to be launching part of the program accessibility training and orientation ongoing uh, and also uh, uh, online to different um, me uh, media, video and training and in person. At the division level, we also gonna be uh, part of our outreach and part of our um, uh, strategy, implementation strategy is to ensure that each division they would be able to go through the same rigor in terms of training and accessibility for management accountability and for staff. No. So the resource would be very much from web content, uh, coordination and web content administration that need to be part of their function. Mm -hmm. The difficulty is that you're then adding on additional workload to existing workload and I understand that there will be a transition period yeah. I'm worried that yeah. are you 
are you certain that it is not going to uh, have an unintended impact uh, or consequence of content just not going up because people are not able uh, or comfortable or don't have the support they need uh, to actually do the work? Because I'm hearing rumblings of that. I don't know how real that is, but there are certainly, I'm hearing we can't get that up now because there's this whole new system and only certain people know how to do it. And so. Uh, um, if I may, mm -hmm. Chair, um, our plan through this project that we have IT accessibility capital project, we will be able to identify the, uh, those area with priority, right? Those legacy system that they said this tour, we can't not, you know, uh, uh, do anything that would be part of the plan that we identify this group and put some uh, remediation plan with resources uh, and in some instances that actually if it does have a bigger impact that we thought would well, let's say uh, take longer and more resources through the capital submission they're going to need to making sure that work by working with us to ensure that will be addressed either revisiting the, the system to see if they have to really create a new roadmap, or is this something part of any project that already going to be addressing that? So we and are we looking at many lenses because uh, we have over 140 capital projects. Many of these would probably would be touching or replacing uh, many system uh, that we have right now identified to date. So I understand the rumbling, understand the concern about resource is an ongoing concern, and we're trying to come up with a number of strategies that we can help addressing this, and being able to say, okay, what are some of the priority from a public facing, a public interest that we need to address right away with this legacy system? Let's put the plan in place, how we can also address to these you know, projects, or should we actually have also different projects that also address that? So it's a number of, of, of uh, uh, I call a combined strategy that we need to do to not. I just want to make sure the divisions have enough resources, that they are being given resources yep. as well. Because too often we have central direction on things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're expected to, to all divisions to A, B, C, and they don't get extra resources or people to do it. That's all. Um, yep. Yep. And that, that those requests don't have to come internally those additional resources don't have to be found by cutting other things within a budget yeah. um, that's intended to come in at zero percent for the following year. I mean, that that's all. Yeah, thank you. Yin. Thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, Yin, to question. I wonder, uh, the way I understand it seems like everything's all revised and done, but <laughs> I just wonder, is there a, sort of an indication where which division or which, um, I don't even know what the term is, but anyways, which part of the city, like all different sites and different sections of the website has been thoroughly checked and, and by um, even the citizen, you know, group. Uh, because I, I'm saying this because as an end user, you know, when I try to I, I fill out a form for uh, one of the grant applications, it was not easy. It was not really accessible. So I, I just wonder, like, so how do I know which part is still being uh, renovated, if you want to use that word, or which part is y you're, you're done, you know, the, the OCAD people or whoever uh, looked at it, revised it, been tested, checked, it's done. Like, is there such an indication of how, uh, what percentage of the website has been um, revised? To the, chair. to the chair, I'll answer that. Um, so as part of the web revitalization, the focus was on content and the, work, the platform for which the website resides, so delivering all the content. Uh, as Lan has mentioned, there are a number of applications, so to your point, there are forms that still exist that are not fully accessible, and we are well aware of those, and that pertains to the thousand plus applications, and we're trying to go through them aggressively. Um, as it relates to the website itself, and, and as I mentioned, the content delivery, um, we know that there are still a remaining uh, number of issues, uh, a very small number of issues. 
Um, and in regards to the applications, that's where our project that we are taking on will start to address all of those forms um, that, you're, that you're indicating. In regards to exact percentages of applications, we've, we are about to commence an audit and that's what's gonna give those statistics for us. So, so we don't have exactly that number yet, um, but we will definitely get that to you as fast as possible and to this committee. So when, when do you think the audits would be done? Just, just an estimate. I would say in, within the next quarter, so by fourth quarter of this year. Okay, thank you very much, Ian. Anyone else with questions? I, I have um, simply, do you have a question, Rahima? Please go ahead. Okay, just hang on tight, we're almost there. Um, with respect to the website within a website, sometimes when you're browsing through the city's uh, sort of main uh, portal, and you want to get a little bit deeper into some of the older details, it goes into an older uh, website. Um, is, are there plans to, to streamline that and bring it all into one aesthetic? Yeah. Okay. That, and and that when, is, when will that be f concluded, the work? I think um, through the projects, uh, that will be also look at uh, a strategy to really uh, continuously evolving the, web, the main website uh, with other existing legacy website as part of the new direction and approach, uh, human-centric, accessible, and custom experience. So that uh, all of this website that you, uh, was developed many years ago, they're gonna need to really be redesigned, be revamped to really uh, meet uh, and achieve the direction. Because the, the city recognized that from a customer service, from a citizen experience, it, the business process to go from one website to another, it does present a number of challenges. Business processes, inconsistent standard. So that is uh, the direction and a very clear is the principle for any new design or any re, uh, uh, revisiting all of this accessible. Okay. Um, with because I, 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 my only in, uh, impairment, I guess, is, is re really my, my, my visual eyes as they get, to, my eyes as they age. Um, and I find, even with a, a very minor, um, I guess, condition, uh, as I move from old pages, a sort of legacy website to the new pages, it really makes a huge difference. Yeah. Um, so how much, of the, how much of the website content is still sitting on the legacy uh, website and, and do you have proportions of how much is already transferred to the new uh, sort of aesthetic? Okay, so, so just a point of clarification, some of the old website, there, there actually isn't uh, any of the old website. I think what, what may be happening is you may be rerouted to sub websites that do exist for particular groups, uh, which were not in scope of the web revitalization. We looked at the City of Toronto as a whole. We've now identified that there are, as you're mentioning, other websites that were created by subunits that we are now trying to bring in house. I see, okay. We don't have the exact percentage of those. We have identified a number and we are, from uh, again that partnership with our, my team and digital communications, we are reaching out to these units to inform, that the, inform them that they are supposed to come on board with the city's website so that we can ensure that we are delivering an effective site for all citizens, yeah. okay. And if, if my, um, I may add, we also have a process that we call a kind of a gentle uh, control process. Any new website to go uh, into production into the city need to actually uh, be reviewed and also sign off by from an accessibility point of view, also from uh, the web um, group as well. So there is now a certain process to ensure that. Uh, not only what is new, but also any existing revamp or change would go to that process, so. Okay. Thank you, that's very helpful. Uh, Yin, to question? And I'm really impressed that, that you got 3.1 million or something for this project. Uh, um, and I, I'm really glad that, that with the procurement that you mentioned that the, any vendor should have that accessibility component. Uh, your employment practice in your division, how many of them are people with disabilities that use assistive devices for communication and information access? Uh, you um, talking about in INT division? 
or in in the city mm -hmm. right in your in your department which is folk mainly responsible for website revitalization so i'm wondering do you even have persons with disabilities that use uh, assistive devices, especially for communication, to to be part of your team. As we mentioned, you know, procurement is not just mm -hmm. machines, but um, I, I would I would assume that's part of your your workforce. Uh, I, I'm not sure, but that's what I'm wondering. So certainly, as we move forward with uh, this project in, in web accessibility, we will be looking at everybody uh, as a potential candidate for any position at the city. Uh, within the web revitalization uh, project and, and on our team currently, uh, there is nobody that has a direct disability that we are aware of. However, uh, we do have a number of staff that are very educated and use these tools, including uh, any uh, accessibility tools for accessing content such as um, audio playback um, and, and BDA and JAWS and so on, and that is what's run through every application, runs through that process before it's released. Um, that being said, and I think Lance mentioned this, this is a great opportunity for us now moving forward, and I think it's extremely important that we start to bring people who use these tools on a day-to-day -day basis. I think that's the only way we will succeed, and that is something we will strive for. It's also something that I believe we really, we really hope to get a lot of feedback from yourselves in regards to communities and agencies that we can reach out to that would be willing to help out uh, with this or maybe be interested in a position. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay, so let's move to the speaking portion. I'll start off with Yin. So uh, I really encourage that because uh, we've already mentioned um, the employment, you know, of persons with disabilities should be increased at the city. So I would start with even internship, you know, um, uh, not wait for your next um, whatever <laughs> phase, but even start considering bringing people on who use Dragon Dictate or JAWS or whatever, you know, s screen reading devices that y you guys want to test. As I said, it, it's hard for people with disability to suddenly, you know, have all the qualifications to, to secure a city job, but if you uh, maybe even start looking at bringing people on at the internship level, volunteer level, or, and you're doing it with the tester, but I'm just saying that um, I really hope to uh, get a, a sort of report back from from your group even on the uh, sort of the staff proportion that represents our community thanks yeah, thank you uh, we um, started actually um, uh, talking to HR division to help us to in establishing internship and I will take your advice uh, definitely to include that so that we can actually create a number of job entry with little uh, qualification so that they, they can be part of that training but also giving us feedback. That's a wonderful suggestion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Anyone else to speak? No? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. May I please have a motion from the committee to receive the presentation? Uh, uh, Stephanie, all those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, before everybody runs away, we're going to tidy up the agenda a little bit. Uh, we're heading back to item number two. And item number two, we had two motions that were being prepared, uh, one from the Employment Working Group and one from Housing Working Group. And so we're just going to put those motions on the screen. Uh, they are all technically and procedurally correct. You want to take a moment? Actually, I'll read it out loud. Sorry, I was just about to, I was just about to do something inaccessible. Uh, um, uh, so the first one is from Wendy. Actually, Wendy, would you like to read it? Sorry, it's your motion. It's really our motion because Councillor Davis was largely behind this, but yep. between the two of us, it reads that the Executive Committee direct the Executive Director Human Resources to develop a Persons with Disabilities Employment Strategy with the purpose of ensuring that persons with disabilities are employed at the City of Toronto at a level reflective of their representation in the population of the city, consistent with council approved directions in item EX 35.5 adopted by the Executive Committee on June 19, 2018, item EX 30.28 adopted by the Executive Committee on January 24, 2008, and the Aboriginal Employment Strategy. 
Okay, thank you very much. And we're gonna table the next motion, vote it all together. Uh, the next motion is coming back from the Housing Working Group. Uh, I'm just gonna read it as it is now amended. Request the General Manager, Shelter Support and Housing Administration to consult with the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee. And this is the amended portion the disability community and appropriate stakeholders in the decision-making process in the first quarter of 2019 in the development of new design guidelines that will apply to all new city-funded shelter infrastructure and redevelopment. Uh, second paragraph is request the general manager shelter support and housing administration to undertake in the consultation on proposed changes to application forms for rent geared to income RGI units, modified units and additional bedroom requests with responsible personal accessibility in Toronto housing. Our PATH committee, a resident-led group that works with Toronto Community Housing Corporation, TCHC, to improve the quality of life for people with disabilities that apply. Uh, so there's no f further limitations. Um, if everyone is okay with those uh, both motions, if I can take them as a package, all those in favor, any opposed, that carries. Uh, thank you very much. Um, before we bring our, our meeting to a full conclusion, uh, I just want to say thank you to all of you for your service and thank you for staying um, as late as you have. I recognize that this is a little bit longer than we, we usually have, but I'm really grateful for your ongoing contributions. And I know that uh, this is uh, Councillor Davis's last meeting. Um, and, uh, and we are very sad to see her go. Certainly I know I am personally. Uh, she's been a, an absolute um, uh, strong and, and steady advocate on all issues around accessibility and inclusion. And she has uh, fought fearlessly every single step of the way. Uh, no one is quicker than her with the pen and the paper when it comes to drafting motions. So she keeps us all on our toes. And, uh, and the city has been that much better uh, for it because of her, her 15 years of service. And I just want to say thank you. Um, and for the committee members, please reapply. I, for those who are not coming to the end of their two-term limit, we have really, I, I think you've all grown into your role. Uh, you know now how this thing works, uh, and we would love to see you back uh, next term. Uh, Rahima, please go ahead. I wrote a, a brief speech. At four years old, Toronto became my new home. City Hall represented that. My goal then was to help serve our city. Thank you for allowing me the honor to sh serve as vice chair of our Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee for two terms. Thanks to Councillor Wong Tam for your leadership, to all committee members and city staff. As my term ends, just remember, I do the same things as you, only in a different way. Voting is one of them. I have one question to all three levels of government. Social isolation can be a barrier to health improvement. Cooperative housing provides member community participation. As we age in place, when will you build accessible, affordable housing? Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're here. Thank you, Rahima, for those comments. And, uh, and on behalf of the committee, I can honestly say that we are sad to see you go. Um, you've been a wonderful vice chair. And thank you very much for letting me get up every now and then and have a body break. It was my pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Um, and of course, to our, our city staff and also to Deidre for, for keeping us honest and straight and, and uh, moving forward, uh, we want to be uh, just acknowledge how much work uh, you do. Um, transforming a corporation's old static ways is not necessarily easy, and this committee is gr very grateful for your thoughtful and, and dedicated guidance. Um, anybody else with concluding remarks? Yes, please, Stephanie. Yes, Council, I'd just like to thank you for your leadership, too, because I think this second term, I feel that we've been really, really productive and that we feel like we are making a difference being on this committee, so thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Uh, Glenn, please. I'm one of the brand new people that had a term of two meetings. <laughs> um, and, and I am applying. But I just wanted to say thank you for this short opportunity thus far. 
And I'm sorry I didn't participate as much in my second meeting as my first. My throat is killing me. I have a throat infection and sinus infection. But I just had to say something and say this has been, has been thus far an amazing experience. And it has encouraged me to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Yin, go ahead, please. Uh, I just I want to add to everybody's sentiment in my appreciation of your leadership, Councillor Wontan. Um, I personally really grew a lot just um, with, uh, you know, working with you. I do want to uh, just suggest, and I don't know where this would go, with the new, um, hopefully, uh, committee members joining, and, and I'm speaking from experience, sometimes there's just a lot we don't know. So can there be a sort of a transition period or overlap period where those of us that cannot reapply or will not uh, be reapplying, um, could pass on some of the um, knowledge or, or, or whatever that, <laughs> that we have um, so that there is continuity. And also, I would strongly suggest a, a bit more fulsome training for uh, be, before the next uh, term uh, st oh, starts uh, because a, a lot of times we, we get some kind of a training at the beginning and it goes way over our head <laughs> and later on. So after being on this committee for six years, now I'm finally understanding Oh, that's how you do it, but it's kind of late. <laughs> so I'm, I'm asking, uh, perhaps as we pass the baton, um, Councillor, that you could just let whoever is taking on uh, over the next committee to consider training and some kind of a transition period between the, the old members and the new. It's an excellent suggestion. I have been writing down those notes. Thank you. Um, Great. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful summer. And, uh, and please, for those who have not reached their end of their two-term limit, uh, reapply. And uh, for those who are no, not, not able to serve again, uh, please let your network know that uh, we're always looking for good people. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.